Hello guys. This is the final part of What If Naruto and Friends Time Traveled previously known as What If Naruto, Rock Lee, and Shikamaru went back in time. Sorry that I did not upload in a while and I will start to upload more. I had a very busy week so I do apologize. If you have subscribed, make sure to tap the bell as only 30% have notification on. This is used so you will be able to see when my next upload is. Let's begin with the video. Naruto could feel Kurama laughing inside of his head, and he didn't like it one bit. He should have known by now that foxes were the embodiment of mischief. Lovely. Gara? Lee asked tentatively, now aware that there was a kunai pointed at his best friend's family jewels. The redhead turned to Lee, his eyes confused for a second before his gaze softened. The kunai dropped onto a bed of sand that Gara had created. No, it's Shikaku. Of course it's me. Gara hissed, rubbing his temples wearily. He was still feeling quite drowsy, and the impending headache that he knew was coming on wasn't going to help. Shikamaru looked at the Suna Nin before turning to Tamari, Kankoro, and Baki. Um, maybe it's best if dash. We leave? Kankoro finished with an eerie smile. Yes, perhaps it is for the best. The trio could only watch as the other three simply sauntered out of the room, leaving them with a very, very weird gara. Tealize followed the door as it swung shut before hardening and pinning poor Uzumaki Namikaze Naruto with a death stare. All right, Namikaze. Explain to me why the bloody hell this is happening, or what this is. Naruto sat down on the bed heavily, still not believing what had happened. Gara, their Gara was back. How was this possible? Like I said, that might have something to do with me. And how exactly did that happen? The weariness was apparent in Naruto's voice. Kurama snorted somewhat sheepishly. Well, you accidentally used some demonic chakra when you sealed my idiot brother, so a transfer must have taken place, and for some reason beyond my scope of knowledge, some of M.Y. chakra brought back the vessel's memories. Well, Gara demanded, though the haughtiness in his tone was replaced by something akin to wonder. The fox. Naruto mumbled. The fox did it. When I sealed Shikaka back into you, the fox is sure that some of his chakra mingled with yours, which probably forced some of Shikaka's chakra to integrate with yours. Biju are weird and no one knows what powers they hold, not even their jinchurikis. So while Shikaku was your Shikaku, the second Kurama's chakra touched Shikaku's, the time-space continuum was probably warped, and somehow, you got your memories from the future through your tailed beast. The Kazakage looked at the Hokage impassively, teal boring into cerulean. After a moment, Gara snorted. And that snort turned into a full-fledged guffaw. The three Kanohanin could only watch as Gara, their Gara burst into uncontrollable laughter which dwindled down to hiccuping sobs. Tears flowed down the future Kazakage's face as the full reality of the situation hit him. Naruto, his brother, his kin, had somehow escaped that hellhole and managed to time travel along with his best friends. How? Well, the answer was simple really. This was Namike's effing Naruto. He always had a particular gift of turning the impossible into the possible. Not even thinking, Gara threw himself into Naruto's arms, crediting his fellow Kage for not commenting about the tears, or the fact that they were soaking through the blonde shirt. Naruto closed his eyes, blinking back tears himself, as he patted Gara's shaggy hair. Yes. This was how he had first felt when they had come to the past. That overwhelming feeling, if you had no one to share it with, it would consume you. And then suddenly, Lee and Shikamaru were there as well, with their arms around the two kages. Right now, they were just barely teenagers, not war-hardened men. Moments passed like that, all in silence. Words would not be enough to describe the emotions, the palpable emotions that writhed through the room creating tangible energy, a guiding force. When Gara finally detached himself from Naruto's shirt, the only evidence of tears was the stains on the blonde's shirt. You idiot. Gara's voice was slightly hoarse. You are the biggest idiot in the world. Kami, his voice was breaking. Then he remembered that he was also currently going through puberty again. 
Maybe he should kill Naruto. I know. Naruto whispered softly, punching Gara on the arm playfully. I know. The Kazakage turned to Lee, shaking his hand before Lee, being Lee, lifted Gara off of the ground, much to the other boy slash man's chagrin and amusement. Nara. Shikamaru's onyx eyes met Gara's. Even if Gara was shorter than him right now, in Shikamaru's mind, all he could picture was the future Gara. A figure of strength, wisdom, and respect. His brother in law. Kazakage sama. Shikamaru bowed his head, not noticing the way that Gara straightened, teal eyes glinting with an unnamed emotion. Take care of my sister. The Nara stood tall, puffing out his chest slightly as he looked to the door that Temari had gone out of. As captain of tactical operations and the Rokadame Hokage's right hand slash best friend, you have my word that I will cherish Sabaku no Temari from the bottom of my heart, give her every ounce of my love, and never disrespect the woman that she is. Gara analyzed the man, for those words were not one that a boy could have said, in front of him. When he had first heard of Shikamaru's intentions towards his sister, like any overprotective brother, he had been set on castrating the man, despite the fact that he was one of his closest friends. However, the love that those two had shown each other, that was something that he could feel between Matsuri and himself. One could not dispute those feelings. So grudgingly, and after several physical threats, the Kazakage had given his blessing to the couple. If only his niece or nephew, no. He would not go down that road, not now. Naruto had given him a gift. He was back, back to help these three change the world for the better. He would not think those negative thoughts. I know, Shikamaru. Gara smiled slightly. Lee observed the dynamics between the two with a wide grin. It was hard to believe that Gara had once tried to kill him, twice, and nearly succeeded. He was told that when Gara had been in his hospital room the first time around, it had taken Shikamaru, Naruto, and Choji to stop him before a sensei came to take Gara away. And now. Now Gara was the Kazakage, one of Lee's comrades, a man who had suffered so much and deserved a chance at happiness. Just like Naruto. While this little reunion is touching and all, Kurama suddenly spoke in Naruto's head, Shikaka's host is about to pass out. Look at him Naruto, he's dead tired. Indeed, Gara had put up the facade of being awake for a long time, but now that Naruto took a closer look, he could see drooping eyelids, the yawns, and the slight swaying of the younger boy's body. The last ten minutes must have been emotionally draining, which would make the already sleep-deprived Gara feel even more tired. Guys, Naruto grasped Gara by the arm and led him to the cot. He needs rest. Gara didn't even resist because he felt tired all of a sudden. It was as if all the energy had been drained from him, like all his bones had turned to goo. Oh. He groaned. Ruto, shish ish your alt. Lee stifled a chortle at the utterly undignified response that Gara gave, but managed to keep a straight face as he slowly watched the boy drift off into a dreamless sleep in a heartbeat. For a moment, the trio was silent, choosing to observe Gara. This looks creepy as hell. Shikamaru deadpanned. We're grown men in shorter and weaker bodies. We do not look at the sleeping body of the future Kazakage whose memories have been transported into his younger body. Naruto could feel his cheeks get warmer, but simply nodded. We'll leave him be for now. What about the invasion? Lee asked suddenly, his mind traveling back to when Sand had tried to usurp the leaf. He had been in the hospital at that time, but rumors of Naruto's heroics had started just about then. And when Naruto came back with Tsunade-sama, those rumors had been cemented. Suna won't take place in it. Shikamaru spoke confidently, looking to Naruto to back up his statement. The blonde grimaced. True, but how do the four of us, he pointed to Gara's softly snoring figure, explain to Tamari-chan, Kenkoro, and Baki-san that the Kazakage is dead, or will die within the next couple weeks, and that their plan with Orochimaru and Sound is effectively over. Garakuen will take care of that. Lee stated, turning to Naruto. Look, Ruto, I get it. You're worried about things falling apart, we all are, 
but now that we have Gara, the Kazakage back with us, things are looking up for us. After today, a hell of a lot of people are going to be scrutinizing us with an eagle eye, especially you. But you know that. The last thing you need to worry about is this. On the bright side though, we now know that Hayate-san will be okay, now that Baki-san won't go against Gara and kill the swordsman. Shikamaru added. Naruto stared Lee with an inscrutable expression. On some level, he knew that Lee was 100% correct, however he still couldn't shake off the feelings of doubt. Not saying another word, the Hokage glanced one last time at the Kazakage before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. His companions, used to their leader's odd mood swings, simply shrugged and left the same way as Naruto. The room which contained the sleeping Kage was silent save for some snores. Gara's face scrunched up in a grimace as he turned to one side. Eyes still closed, he wiggled around slightly, as if uncomfortable. And then, he farted. A great big rip that tore through the air, resonating in the very wood of the room. The boy's face softened, and an expression of utter bliss was displayed upon his face. When his siblings and sensei would come back some time later, they would forever wonder as to why Gara was smiling, or why the room's air seemed a bit stale. Or why his sand was still making funny shapes in the sand, most of them resembling a fox, an octopus, a deer, a turtle, a monkey, and some other ones that they didn't recognize. And all the while, a great big raccoon would be laughing hysterically in the boy's mind picturing eight other great beasts, all frolicking around in a giant meadow. Senju Tsunade was a complicated woman. She really was. Some thought of her as a coward for running away after Dan died, and after the Kyuubi attacked, for forsaking the village when it needed her the most. The same village that her grandfather had built. The same village that whispered the Senju name with reverence. Others thought of her as a woman who was so bottled up, that they took pity on her and forgave her drinking and gambling. Everyone agreed though that she was a legend who was unparalleled in medical jutsus and strength. She was after all part of the legendary Sanin. But none of those people asked her what she thought of herself. Truth be told, she wasn't quite sure herself. Sitting here, 50 miles from Kanoa, in some dingy bar, throwing away money like it was garbage, she was too hammered out of her mind to even care anymore. Yet it was in moments like these that she felt as though she had the most clarity. It was in moments like these that the sorrow of years past, of regrets, of what-ifs took over, and the drinking and gambling were the only things that could drown those regrets, those sorrows. Hit me. She slurred, not noticing that Shizun had taken her cup of sake away. Hit me. A voice deep within her cried. Please. It's a sword, not an exploding seal. Karama muttered in Naruto's head as the blonde glared at the large pointy thing in front of him. It was the first time that he was looking at the sword of his great grand uncle, sort of, properly. The last time he had seen it was when it was poking out of his shoulder. Naruto. Shikaku placed a finger on the bridge of his nose. Morning had dawned, and for the first time in a long time, Chaos was present in the Nara clan's house because of the trio. Yesterday's shenanigans had naturally trickled down the shinobi grapevine, and many of the younger Nara children were clamoring to see the kids who had created such a ruckus. The older Nara ninjas were more discreet in their observation, eventually mumbling many troublesomes under their breaths before leaving the time travelers alone. How the hell do I use a sword? Naruto exhaled in frustration. Can't I just give it back to the Hokage? He knew that he was almost whining, and that whining was undignified for a 22-year-old, as well as the future leader of the Leaf, but right now he was back in his 12-year-old body with 12-year-old hormones coursing through that very same body. That warranted some whining. Kami. Lee poked his friend on his forehead. Just man up and learn. You could ask Hayate-san, or Yuga senpai and besides, it's better if the sword is with you rather than Orochimaru. You sound like me. Shikamaru remarked, smirking slightly. We've spent so much time together that it's hard not to. Lee replied, stretching out on the soft grass beneath him. At the moment, 
The time travelers plus Shikaku were enjoying the cool breeze of the morning sprawled out on the wide expanse of nature in the Nara clan's backyard. Dear Grace nearby, none of them bothering the four shinobi. Shikaku used the silence to observe the trio besides him. He shook his head and figured he was going to be repeating that action quite a bit from now on. Time travel. Even though he had been the one to figure it out, it still seemed impossible. Ten years. They had won a war ten years in the future, the fourth shinobi world war to be precise. Nearly every ninja in this village, around the hidden countries, had died, and these children, these men were bearing that burden. The eyes that Shikaku had thought to be so old, now that everything was put in perspective, he was right. Never had he imagined that his own son would have those eyes. Eyes like his, a man who had witnessed the carnage of the Third World War and the Kyubi's attack. Both times they had been saved by Namake's Minato. A bitter laugh escaped him. How ironic. Minato had helped end the Third World War and sacrificed himself to the Shinigami when the Kyubi had attacked. Naruto had protected the village by turning into a human sacrifice and helped end the Fourth World War by sacrificing himself to the sands of time so that he could change what was going to happen. Blondes, Namikazes, were especially troublesome. Someone's coming. Naruto stated softly, flicking his eyes to a spot ten feet from them. Sure enough, a second later, an ANBU, with a rabbit mask, appeared silently, bowing deeply to Shikaku. Commander. An androgynous voice spoke quietly. Yusagi. Shikaku replied, curious as to what this operative could want. That was made clear when the ANBU's head tilted in Naruto's direction, something which did not escape the boy's notice. Hokage-sama has requested Uzumaki's presence in the towers. It is urgent. Lee and Shikamaru stood casually, stretching their limbs as they did so. To Shikaku, however, there was nothing casual in those movements. He hid a smirk. They were gauging the ANBU, seeing what he or she was going to do next, and react accordingly. Those two were protecting Naruto. Naruto winced slightly as he also got up. His wounds were almost healed, even with Kurama helping, and what the medics had done yesterday. It seemed as though Shikaku's sand whips went deeper than he had thought. He sighed deeply. What could the hawk? How could I have forgotten? His subconscious yelled loudly. Of course. It was the day after the preliminaries. That was the day that he had met. With a twinkle in his eye, Naruto nodded at the ANBU and threw a wide grin at his friends whose faces cleared as they understood as well. Shikamaru nudged his father in a gesture that clearly said I'll tell you later, and he too nodded, albeit in confusion. Let's go ANBU-san. Naruto hurriedly sealed Raijin into its proper scroll. Together, they vanished, one in a swirl of leaves, the other, a poof of smoke. So, Shikaku turned to his son and Lee. You want to explain to me what Naruto is so excited about? For Jiraiya, waiting one more night to see his godson was torture. He and the Sandame had a long chat last night, which involved much sake, self-loathing, self-pitying, and some tears. Though the last part was something he would take to his grave. He was furiously pacing the length of the Hokage's office, annoying Saratobi to no end, and driving himself insane because of the nervousness and excitement that he was feeling. Leaning against the wall, Ao had to admit that this situation was slightly nerve-wracking. Why the Hokage and the Sanin had requested his presence here was beyond him. Sure, Uzumaki might be a distant relative, but would dropping two bombshells on him in one day, within a few minutes be wise? The child was after all, just that, a child. Could he take the knowledge that his own godfather had left him alone for thirteen years, or that the family that he had thought he hadn't had was alive? Naruto was strong, that much Ao knew for a fact. He was exceptional, but considering his parentage and ancestry, that much was to be expected. He hoped to get to know the boy better in the next month. 
After much deliberation, Ao had decided that he would stay in Kanoha instead of heading back to Mizu. After sending the letter to Mesama later today, he was sure that she would understand. He's going to hate me. Jiraiya wailed, clenching his fists. I know he will. Ao stifled a snort when he saw the Hokage roll his eyes in exasperation. Jiraiya dashed the old man began slowly, Naruto Kuen is understanding, much like his father. He will understand why you, never. He trailed off, coughing slightly, no doubt trying to word his next sentence carefully. But the Sanin's pathetic expression stopped him from saying anything. Jiraiya knew that he should have been for Naruto, knew that he should have been there to train the boy, so that he could puff up in pride when the kid did something extraordinary like he had done yesterday. And he definitely should have protected the kid from that snake bastard. But he hadn't been there, and it was killing him, eating him from the inside. Orochimaru, Minato, Kushina, Tsunade, he hadn't been able to protect those he cared for. And he had made the same mistake with Naruto as well. Come to think of it, so had Tsunade. Ao pushed himself off the wall and placed a hand on the older man's shoulder. It wasn't much support, but he was man of few words, so this was all that Ao could give the Sanin. Their brooding was cut short by a puff of smoke. Ao could feel Jiraiya trembling under his hand, but did not comment upon it. Instead, his eyes were fixed on the boy who had appeared from within the smoke. His eyes went back from the Hokage, to Jiraiya, to Ao. When Ao made eye contact with the child, there was a flicker of surprise that was hidden quickly, but not quick enough. And then, the Hokage spoke. The feelings in his stomach were driving Naruto insane. Six years. It had been six years since he had seen his godfather, the man who had training him for three years, who had sheltered him, who had nourished him so that he could actually grow, who had taught him so many valuable lessons, and who had given his life to protect him. He was going to be meeting the man who had been a father to his father, a perverted uncle to his mother, and precious to Naruto himself. The first time that they had met, Naruto obviously hadn't known who he was, except that he was perverted and an old man. Naruto hadn't known that because of this man, he had his name, or that this, Erosinin, was actually his godfather. He hadn't known this until Pain attacked, and by that time, it had been too late. In many ways, Jiraiya's death had been a catalyst for Naruto's growth and power. His eyes had been opened to the realities of war. His beloved sensei had been taken from him, and revenge was the only thing on his mind. He had mastered sage mode, defeated pain, and talked into returning the lives of those who had died because of Jiraiya's memory of his sacrifice. However, revenge was exactly what Nagato had been talking about, for revenge was a type of hatred. Hatred breeds hatred, the man had said, and it was a never-ending cycle, a cycle which Naruto had vowed to break. Naruto, though, after the real war had broken out, had also realized that hatred was a part of human nature, and that truly breaking the cycle was nigh impossible. Hatred was yet another emotion that everyone felt, even if that person was a saint. He hated Sasuke because that man had taken everything from them, he wanted revenge on Sasuke for killing Sakura, and that's when Naruto understood that he was no better than anyone else. He, too, was only human after all. Right now, though, when the smoke cleared, Sasuke, the war, everything came second to this. He desperately tried to keep the tears behind his eyes, hiding them by looking at everyone in the room. The Hokage, his godfather, and Aosan? That was unexpected. The surprise that he felt stemmed the drat wetness in his eyes, though, and he was able to look at Jiraiya without wanting to throw his arms around him and sob into his chest like a child. Naruto. Sarutobi's voice drew Naruto's eyes to the current Hokage. Gigi. Care to tell me what's going on? Naruto responded, drawing what sounded like a smothered cough from Ao and a snicker from Jiraiya. A smile tugged Naruto's lips upwards. He's inherited the Uzumaki bluntness, I see. Ao remarked, 
immediately drawing parallels to his own Kage and her frighteningly frank mannerism of talking. He's inherited quite a bit. The wizened old man puffed on his pipe, letting his eyes steady the teen. Naruto had grown taller over the last couple months, he had filled out somewhat as well. His hair, as spiky and blonde as always, had become longer, making him look like a younger Minato. The resemblance was startling, and it wouldn't be surprising if in a couple of years, people would think that the Yandame had returned. Then, guilt tore through him like a kunai. Naruto had grown taller because he had been living with the Naras. They had fed him properly, ensuring that his ramen intake was low enough so that the proper nutrients could circulate through the boy's body. The Nara clan had done in two months what he couldn't in twelve years. They had given him a family, people to support him, they had given him a place where he belonged. If only he had spent more time with Naruto, maybe taking him in, then maybe. Gigi Naruto sounded reproachful, as if he knew what Saratobi was thinking. The old man smiled hesitantly. Forgive an old man lost in his own thoughts, in Naruto? He cleared his throat and stood up, making his way over to the boy. I'm sure you are wondering why you are in my office, yet again. Naruto chortled. Oh, I think I know why. He put on his best innocent face. This is because of yesterday, right? Honestly, Gigi, I'm fine, we all are. He took off the black shirt he had been wearing as if to prove his point. Yes, the scars from yesterday were visible, but they were fading. Jiraiya's fists clenched. There shouldn't be any scars. His godson shouldn't have had to go through that. He didn't care if as a shinobi, it was only expected that Naruto was going to get hurt. Right now, he wasn't a shinobi, he was a man who was remembering the face of an innocent, sleeping infant who had no idea about what hardships lay in front of him. Pulling the garment back over his head, Naruto grinned. And Gara is fine as well. He's probably sleeping soundly as we speak. After all, one does not simply sleep for a night when there are twelve years of lost sleep to catch up on. Saratobi placed a hand on Naruto's head, ruffling his hair slightly. Hi hi, I trust that the boy is fine, however, I will send someone to verify that. But that's not the reason as to why you are here. Naruto grimaced under the Hokage's touch, but made no other sound except a quiet O. Oh. Before we continue, would you mind telling me how long ago you found about you parents? And the truth this time, please. Your story yesterday had many holes to it. Naruto was ready for this question. He had been waiting for it, actually. Aha, Gigi, sorry for lying. Well, after Mizuki told me about me, Burden, everything made much more sense. The glares, the fear, the hatred, it clicked into place. We had a week before we were assigned teams, so in my spare time, I started looking into hospital records, hoping to find something, or rather, someone named Uzumaki. He paused, locking eyes with his godfather for a second before continuing. Naturally, nothing could be found. But when Kakashi Sensei was assigned as our Sensei, that's when my suspicions were confirmed. Everyone knew that he was the student of the fourth, but why would he want me, someone who was the living reminder as to why his sensei was killed, on his team? Naruto felt slightly guilty at Hokage's flinch, but spoke on. And then there was that way that he would look at me sometimes, no with hatred, but with regret, remorse, sadness. He wasn't lying about the looks from Kakashi. It had taken him a long time to figure them out, but they had been there. So I figured if he didn't hate me, then it had to do with something pertaining to the Yandame. The teen's eyes pierced his father's portrait. Our looks were just so similar, we had to be related. He couldn't be my brother, so he had to be my father, or uncle, but father made more sense. There was silence for just a minute. As for mom, well, he rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. That's a bit complicated. Brat. The fox started cautiously, sensing that he was going to say something about him. Relax, Karama, I'm obviously not going to reveal anything. 
The fox snorted, but placed his head on his paws, resting. When you say complicated. Ao entered the conversation for the first time, thinking that there was something that he was missing. Naruto knew he could trust this man. He had died in the war, but he had been honorable and brave, not to mention strong. Shinobi-san, you should know that I am the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. Startled gasps were heard from Sarutobi and Jiraiya. Seriously? Had they really expected him to not reveal that? Even if it was to a veritable stranger? It was his secret to give away after all. Ao, on the other hand, was surprised, but it did not come as a shock to him. It would only make sense that the Yandame would use his own son as the vessel, as opposed to some random orphan. A scowl briefly appeared on his face. Yagura had been a Jinchuriki as well, one who had no shame in using his power to kill those with bloodlines, to murder thousands. However Naruto was different, somehow, Ao knew that this child was very different. Your childhood must not have been pleasant, was all the Mizu Jonin said. The blonde boy just snorted. That it was not. He turned back to the Hokage. Now, before you think the seal is weakening, because it is not, hear me out. There was weariness present in the old man's eyes, and he sat back down. Go on. When I learned about my father, I confronted the fox. Said Fox sighed deeply. Naruto. Sarutobi's eyes glinted sharply. What? I confronted the fox. Naruto repeated. So that I could confirm the fact that Namike's Minato was indeed my father. Naruto chuckled, remembering the first time he had actually confronted the fox. And he did. Of course, then he rambled on about how he was going to kill me when he got out of the jail. He also told me that he was put inside of me by my father and mother, and that I my ancestors had been his previous hosts. That's when I got interested, so I asked him about the people who had imprisoned him, and he was all too willing to oblige me. He told me how my mother's great-grand-aunt, Uzumaki Mido, who had been the Shodai Hokage's wife, had sealed him inside of her during a battle with some guy, and how my mother was chosen to be the new vessel because of her ties to the Senju clan and her special chakra. So that's how I know about my parents. The story was plausible, and there was no reason for him to lie, unless you know... He was actually the future Rokudame Hokage who had performed a jutsu that had brought him and his two best friends ten years into the past to escape a veritable hell hole, so they should believe him. No one spoke. Naruto felt that he was trapped by three sets of eyes, but didn't flinch. May I check the seal? Jiraiya spoke softly. Obsidian eyes met shimmering cerulean. For a moment, Jiraiya swore that he was looking at a twelve-year-old Minato again. Even disregarding all the physical similarities between father and son, it was those eyes which connected Naruto to Minato. Those eyes that looked far too old to be on a twelve-year-old. Those eyes that sparkled with confidence, with mischief, with caution, with happiness. That was all Minato. Naruto, when you took control of my chakra, your seal took on a new shape. Remember? It became the Tori seal, in the shape of old man Rakuto's Magatama beads. And that new shape will stay even though you are in this body. Kyuso. I didn't think about that. Inwardly, he was panicking even if his face remained stoic. What do we do? Stop him. You know I can't do that. There always is another way. Damned fox. Can't you just cast we just cast a small genjutsu or something? I mean, you are a fox. Mischief runs in your veins. They'll feel the chakra, the fox deadpanned. A light bulb went off in Naruto's head. Chakra, that's it. Ha ha. Thanks, Karama. Ano, Naruto began. Instead of checking the seal... Can't you check my chakra instead? Jiraiya understood. That's right. If the seal has weakened, then some of the fox's chakra would escape. That would work as well, maybe even better than checking the seal. 
Breathing a quick and undetected sigh of relief, Naruto channeled chakra into every limb of his body, expending it at a frightening rate. Two A and B U appeared in the corner at the sudden spike of powerful chakra, but left seeing that it was only Uzumaki. Although they were rather surprised to see the legendary Sanin and the mist's bloody sensory in the Hokage and Uzumaki's midst. There's not a taint in his chakra. Jiraiya revealed, much to everyone's surprise. Sarutobi frowned. Naruto, you released part of the fox's chakra during the Battle of Wave. How is it possible that there is not a trace of it in your system? The teen looked startled for just a split second before recovering. To that, I honestly have no answer. Damn it! When my older self merged with my 12-year-old self, I didn't realize this was going to happen. How could I have forgotten that I used your chakra on the bridge? The fox didn't reply, but opted to snort a couple times instead which put a scowl on Naruto's face. Is something wrong? Sarutobi asked, concerned. No. The boy said shortly. I'm just wondering why it's not contaminated. Bullshit. Perhaps you purified it somehow. Ao suggested. No one knows for sure how tailed beasts operate. We just know that they are a ball of malevolence. Perhaps your parents did something before they died to ensure that even if part of the seal is chipped away, it will repair itself. Now, as a seal master, Naruto knew that what Ao was theorizing would never work. It would require an even greater sacrifice than the Shiki Fuin. A self-repairing seal like his was simply not possible. However, right now, H.M., maybe. I'm sorry, Shinobi-san, I didn't catch your name. Naruto said politely, inwardly chiding himself for sounding so, he didn't know what he sounded like. Ao strode forward and held out his hand which Naruto took. Damn, up close, with that eye patch, Ao looked pretty intimidating. My name is Ao, pleasure to meet you Uzumaki-san. Please call me Naruto, Ao-san. The boy grinned. It would be good to get to know his allies early on. In the trying times ahead, alliances, friendships would be needed. Likewise, the blue-haired man calmly walked back to his spot on the wall and relaxed there. Naruto, the old man, confused as to how to proceed. Now, the real reason as to why I've called you here is because Dash... I've got this, Sensei. Jiraiya cut in, holding his hand up. Taking a deep, steadying breath, he turned to his godson. Do you know who I am? Said godson wanted to jump up and down and scream yes, but he held it in. Instead, he opted to look the older man up and down. You're Jiraiya-sama, the Toad Sanin. Jiraiya nodded. And I was also your father's sensei. Naruto sighed heavily. Yes, I know. That's not exactly a secret. Jiraiya took another deep breath and gently ruffled Naruto's hair, which caused the boy to look up in shock, wistfulness. But that's not all I am. Naruto, I'm dash, he choked over his words. I'm your godfather. There, he had said it. It was out in the open. And although Jiraiya felt much lighter, he found that the inscrutable expression on Naruto's face was putting an even heavier weight on him. Inwardly, of course, Naruto felt happiness soar through him, but outwardly, he kept his face calm. But seriously, he had his godfather back. I see. Damn, he should have joined the TI department because the mind games that Naruto was playing with Jiraiya were worthy of Ibiki's praise. Without further ado, Naruto's fist collided with the Sanin's stomach, sending him stumbling back about two meters. There was silence in the room, though Naruto thought there was the beginning of a smirk on Ao's face. That was something Kushinachan would have done. Jiraiya coughed twice and massaged his aching gut. But there was a small, remorseful smile on his face. Don't tell me that you don't deserve it. Naruto let out a breath before cautiously approaching his godfather. 
The two stared at each other for a moment before Naruto threw caution to the wind and flew into him, wrapping his arms around the older man's torso. For a moment, Jiraiya was too stunned to do anything. But after a moment, and holding in his tears, he let out a cheer and returned Naruto's hug just as enthusiastically. This hadn't happened the first time they had met, so for Naruto, this was a novel experience. For once, he could pretend that he didn't have the burden of the world on his shoulders, he could pretend that he was a normal 12-year-old who had just learned that part of his family was still alive. This time around, this man wouldn't die, he couldn't die. Naruto had already lost him and Tsunade Bachan once, he wasn't ready to lose them a second time. Kiddo, I'm going to teach you everything I taught your old man. Jiraiya exclaimed cheerfully, looking much younger all of a sudden. Sarutobi chuckled, enjoying the scene in front of him. Naruto, there's a bit more to the story. This time, Naruto was genuinely curious. I'm sorry? The Hokage nodded to Eo, who took over. I don't know how much you know about the Uzumaki clan, but you probably are aware that they are renowned for their sealing as well as longevity. Naruto simply nodded, not knowing where this was going. He had wondered why Eo didn't seem surprised when Naruto revealed he was the son of the Yandame and Uzumaki Kushina. Perhaps this would explain why. Good, well then you should know as well that the Uzumaki and Senju clans were cousins, and that the spiral on every Chunin and Jonin flak jacket is the Uzumaki clan symbol. Eo paused, and saw that the boy didn't seem surprised in the least. Well, considering that he knew that the Shodame's wife was an Uzumaki, that was to be expected. Now Naruto was really confused. I do know these things, but please continue. After the Second Shinobi World War, the Uzumaki clan, which was feared throughout the Five Nations, was destroyed. Kumo and IWA led the attack, and there were only a couple handfuls of survivors. Among those was your mother, of course. You knew my mother? Naruto inquired. Well, this was news. No, not really. Ao rubbed the back of his head. I knew of her, but I didn't know her. Now this is where it gets interesting. The surviving Uzumakis fled, some to what is now rain country, aim, but most went to Kirigakur. As far as I know, your mother was the only one to go to Kanoha because of her relation to the Senju clan. Naruto narrowed his eyes, something which Ao caught on to right away. Naruto Kuen, your mother's great grandfather was the Shodai Yuzukage, the brother of Uzumaki Mito Sama. The Yuzukage married a woman from the Senju clan, a cousin of the Shodai and Nidai Hokages, just how Mito Sama married your Shodame. Eo announced, gauging the boy's reaction. The boy on his part remained silent, digesting the information. Yes, he knew that he was related to Tsunade Bachan because of the Uzumaki clan, and that his mother had strong ties to Mito Basama. The woman had told him this herself when he had been given his parents' belongings at the age of 16. To learn that the woman that you considered a grandmother was nearly that, the feeling was like euphoria coupled with betrayal. After all, Tsunade Bachan hadn't been in his life until he was 12. The news that the Yuzukich had married a Senju woman was new to him, though. Oh, and the fact that the man had been his great-great-grandfather. Tsunade was Kushinachan's aunt of sorts, but called her Nechan instead of Bachan. Jiraiya added quietly, After you were born, she, we just left. She took her dead fiancé's niece and left. The council told me that I was to repair our spy circuit, so I left too. The unspoken I'm sorry was heard loud and clear. No. He wouldn't let tears fall. He couldn't. Not now. So I'm one half of the remaining Sinjess. Naruto finally spoke, his voice cracking ever so slightly. Or are there more? The Mizu Jonin had to give the boy credit. For finding out so much in such little time, he was taking it remarkably well. No, you are the last from the Shodai Yuzukage line. It should also be noted that your grandfather, 
Kushin Asama's father, was the Naidame. Because of the clan's long lifespan, the Shodai was able to live for quite a while and passed the title on to his grandson rather than his son who declined. And it was because of this that your mother was called the Princess of Whirlpool, which makes you the prince. Naruto's jaw tightened as he slumped down in a chair. His mother? His mother was the daughter and great-granddaughter of Kaguya's? And she was related to five slash sixths of the Kages of Kanoha. And for the love of Inari, he was a prince. Oh, when the council members found about this. Ah, the irony. An orphan boy who had been shunned for the first twelve years of his life was related to some of the most powerful people in the world. Anything else you want to throw at me? He said weakly. Actually, yes. Ao smirked. I'm from the Uzumaki clan, and as is the new Mizukage, Terumi Mesama. That had Naruto jolting in his seat. His surprised expression made Ao chortle. Mesama and your mother were second cousins, while my grandmother was part of the clan. Though I was raised in Kiri, my mother was born in Yuzu. There's a reason why I never took a last name. Even if I was suspected of having ties to the Uzumaki clan, it would mean death. Which is why Mesama took her paternal grandfather's last name as well. He wasn't an Uzumaki. He could add cousin to the Mizukage to his mother's repertoire of Kage relatives, and by default, his too. Naruto had known that the Uzumaki clan was still around. Karen and Nagato were proof of that. Had Mesama known that they were cousins when they had met for the first time? If so, why hadn't she said anything? Was she not sure? I, I don't know what to say. Naruto muttered. How much had changed since they had come here? His relatives were not closely related to him, but they held the same blood. They were family. He clenched his hands into fists. There was a fine sheen of tears in those cerulean pools. His hand unconsciously went around his neck, where the Shodai's necklace had rested. When Naruto had been nineteen, Tsunade had been killed by Kabuto. With her last breaths, she had told him that he was her world, the grandson that she had never had, and the reason why she fought. This was three months after she had given him the mantle of Hokage. She knew who he was, she knew that he was the son of her niece. For twelve years, she had been out of his life, drinking and gambling to forget what the village had taken away from her. But, why? He had gone through hell because of his loneliness. It wasn't until he met Tucci and I am that he truly smiled. He had been seven then. They had given a meaning to his life. He had wanted to make I am smile, or Tucci ruffle his hair. That was when he had discovered the concept of love. When Tsunade had first told him that his mother had been her niece, betrayal was the first emotion that ran through Naruto. How long had he known her? In that time, why couldn't she have just told him the truth instead of hiding it? Betrayal had dwindled down to sorrow, which had changed to weary acceptance. Of course, Naruto had also told the woman quite bluntly that now, she had no excuse to not want to be called Bachan, because Naruto had every right to call the woman that. She hadn't even argued with him about it. The Sandame, who had been monitoring the various emotions flashing across the young man's face, sighed. I'm sorry, Naruto. This must have come as a surprise. The blonde scoffed. Surprise doesn't begin to cover it, GG. His head hurt. Yes, he knew that the remaining members of the Uzumaki clan lived in secret like Nagato and Karen, but still, to find out a woman who you had fought with, who you were respected, was family. Maybe Niji was right, maybe the concept of fate was real, and that the human race is simply supposed to follow a predestined path, instead of making a new one. If such a concept existed, that it would make sense that Naruto was finding out the whole truth in this timeline. His own had been compromised. Speaking of them, he really needed to get both of them on their side, preferably before Cousin Dearest destroyed all of Kanoha, and Karen was betrayed by Sasuke. There was a lull in the room. 
Naruto could feel three pairs of eyes on him, but he resolutely ignored them, even his own godfather. For several minutes, silence permeated the room while Naruto pondered what would happen now. Naruto? The Hokage said softly. Gigi. The boy stood and bowed, something that he had not done too often. Forgive me, but understandably, this is quite a lot to take in. I, I'm processing it well enough, but... He sighed and looked at the old man whose face looked quite haggard. For someone who's never known what being in a family has felt like, I'm not quite sure how to react. His dry laugh lacked emotion. I learned that my mother was descended from Kagiz, that one of the legendary Sinin is my godfather, that the Mizukich and her trusted Jonin are cousins, and confirmed the fox's words about how those in the Senju clan are my relatives as well. So like I said, I'm not quite sure how to react. Naruto didn't react when a large hand was placed on his head. It was Jiraiya. He would recognize the comforting gesture in his sleep. But even so, he couldn't bring himself to look up at his beloved grandfather. He wasn't being unreasonable, was he? Naruto wanted nothing more than to spend the rest of the day with Jiraiya and even Aosan now, but with his non-reaction, perhaps they wouldn't want to. Why don't we all get a nice bowl of ramen? Jiraiya interrupted Naruto's thoughts, his voice softer than Naruto remembered. Now that had the intended effect on Naruto. Regardless of anything going on around him, ramen, the food of Kamisama, never failed to cheer him up. As Jiraiya's hand wove through blonde locks that were so similar to Minato's, Naruto smiled a true smile. Things had definitely changed. The only problem was figuring out how those changes had affected the future. They must have made an odd sight. The Hokage, smiling fondly at a Mizu Jonin, Uzumaki Naruto, and a legendary Sanin who were chatting animatedly about who knew what in front of him. A couple civilians openly gawked at the quartet, but resisted to glare at the Uzumaki child as they normally did because A. What he had done in the exams had reached their ears. And B. They didn't want to draw the wrath of the Hokage or the Toads and Nin who looked as though there was nothing more important than Naruto in the world. Jiraiya noted with a feeling of great nostalgia and irony that the ramen stand where Naruto had led them to was the exact same stand where Minato and Kushina frequented. Hell, Minato had even proposed marriage here. He would have to let Naruto know this of course. Welcome to Dash, the man running the shop faltered at the sight of the Sinin, a powerful-looking, earring-wearing foreign ninja, the Hokage himself, and Naruto. Tuchiji-san Naruto squealed in happiness, his mouth already beginning to water in anticipation. Tuchi, who had gotten over his slight shock quickly, called for I am who to her credit, merely blinked once at the sight of the powerful people before asking for their orders. I'll have five bowls of beef ramen. But I want three with a miso base and two tonkatsu. Naruto clapped his hands in excitement. The slightly older girl just smiled at the oddly specific order. Only five bowls, Naruto? She teased gently. Naruto just laughed. Yeah, just five. I'll probably come back later maybe with Shika and Lee. We're sparring in a couple hours, and I don't fancy puking over fields. Naruto didn't even comment when the girl blushed at Lee's name. Sure, he was odd, but out of anyone in this village, Naruto knew that I am was adept at looking underneath the underneath in order to find the true essence of a person. That's what she and her father had done with him, right? When the others had given their own orders, Naruto relaxed in his chair, the tension he had been carrying on his back vanishing slightly. The war had destroyed this place, destroyed the majority of the fond childhood memories that Naruto had. Miraculously, Ayam and Tuchi had survived. Well, many civilians had. They weren't on the battlefield, and the villages themselves were rarely attacked. Many civilians had fled. To where, Naruto wasn't quite sure. Possibly west, where the samurais lived, away from ninjas, away from death, away from everything. 
Who are Shika and Lee? Jiraiya asked from his right, breaking his chopsticks and dipping them into the steaming bowl of heaven in front of him. Huh? Naruto shook himself slightly. Seriously, these little moments of spacing out were costing him if he didn't know when his own food was being served. Enthusiastically slurping the first godly bite of his favorite food, he wiped his face before turning to his godfather. Shika and Lee are my best friends. Shika is short for Shikamaru, as in Nara Shikamaru, son of Nara Shikaku. He's a lazy bastard, but you'll never meet anyone with a sharper mind than him. Lee is Rock Lee, Gai Sensei's most ardent and only devotee, and a Taijutsu genius. He's going to surpass Gai Sensei soon. The confidence in Naruto's voice, the determined glint in his eyes, they all made Jiraiya believe that whatever Naruto had said would come true. The Nara clan have sort of adopted those too. Sarutobi added with amusement. If I'm not mistaken, Naruto and Lee stay at the Nara complex at least five nights a week. Shikaku-san called us puppies. Naruto whined, already done with his second bowl. Meanwhile, Ao simply opted to watch and not participate in this conversation. Unwittingly, he knew that he was drawn into his distant cousin's bubbly, yet somewhat serious personality. Underneath the power, there lay a child, a child who had gone through hardships no child should have to bear. A child who had risen above those hardships by concealing his true emotions under a smile and become a young man. That was something that Ao could respect. Meisama would no doubt be pleased to find that Kushinasama's child was doing well. His long visible eye glinted with mischief. Ao couldn't wait until the two met each other. He wanted to see Meisama's reaction for himself. Na, Ao-san. Ao eyed the blonde boy who was looking at him with a look of utter concentration. Nanny, Naruto Kuen? May I call you an ai san Ao blinked, an unfamiliar warmth spreading throughout his body. His eyes widened slightly before he regained his composure. Looking at the young man's expectant visage, Ao quirked his lips upwards. That would be nice. The smile on the teen's face was nearly blinding. He turned to Jiraiya with a smirk on his face. I'm calling you Arojiji. I know that you write those ridiculously perverted books that Kakashi Sensei reads, which are the same ones that Gigi thinks he has hidden in the secret compartment in his third drawer. I don't care who you are, you're just a perverted Gigi, so I'm calling you Arojiji. He paused. Or Arosinin. It depends on my mood. Ignoring the sputtering from both the Hokage and the Sage, the boy dug into his ramen with even more gusto, a self-satisfied grin on his face. Jiraiya was silently mouthing Arojiji to himself in horror, while the Hokage was thinking of new hiding spots for his porn collection. But Ao didn't know the latter part. All he saw was a look of intense concentration on the Hokage's face. And as the meal continued, Ao could feel a genuine smile building on his own face. When was the last time he had smiled so widely? He couldn't even remember. Leaning back in his chair, his thoughts were focused upon the enigma to his left. Said enigma belched rather loudly in a manner completely undignified for a prince, but very much acceptable to the Sinin, who was giggling madly as he regaled tales of Kushinasama's many pranks on Minato-sama, himself, and Tsunade-sama. Kanoha may not be so bad. Ao mused as Naruto pulled on his hand, drawing him into the conversation as well. Yes. I could get used to this. Shut up. Naruto pouted at his two best friends who were currently hunched over on the ground, seemingly dying with laughter. After the meal, Naruto had left, saying that he had wanted to go train with his best friends, but had promised to visit both his godfather the following day. Training had ended in half an hour, and now they were all lazing on the backyard of the Nara complex. Gomen Rudo Lee wiped tears of mirth from his eyes. But the idea of you dash, he promptly burst into another bout of chuckles and snorts. As a prince, Shikamaru added, 
he was in the same predicament as Lee. Is troublesome? Naruto scoffed, pulling up blades of grass as he did so. It does make sense, I suppose. Shikamaru stated wisely. You're the Hokage. You have the air of a natural leader. You have natural charisma, charm, looks, prestige dash. Are you writing my bio for a dating ad? Naruto grumbled, smirking inwardly. Or do you want me? The last part was said in what was supposed to be a seductive whisper. Lee held both hands over his mouth to keep from exploding into laughter. Shikamaru gagged slightly. No. I'm just saying that it's natural for you to be a leader. It's in your blood. To know that you are related to Mesama and Aosan, no matter how distant it is, is surprising. Naruto sighed. In my blood or not, this is going to be troublesome. Last time around, when my heritage was released, we were all fighting on the same side so IWA couldn't be bothered that I was the son of their hated enemy. But by the looks of things, my heritage will be public knowledge, or at least to the shinobis, within the next year. Since the world hasn't been destroyed yet, they would hold no qualms in attacking me. The trio stared at the swirling leaves that the wind was gently blowing. Spirals The formation the leaves as they fell were taking were in the shape of a spiral. Ruto Shikamaru started slowly. Nanny? Talk to the Uchiha. To his credit, Naruto didn't even flinch. Instead, he stared at Shikamaru in disbelief. What? Shikamaru sighed. Look, you decided that Sasuke was going to defect even before we could begin to change the future. But think about it, he's twelve. I know that he defected at that age, but you need to talk to him. You, more than anyone, can help him. If he defects, then so be it, but at least talk to him first. The kid has a point, Naruto. You're judging a brat based on actions that he has not committed. The Namakaze was silent as he contemplated Shikamaru's words and Kurama's input. Perhaps Shika was right. He had been harsh on Sasuke, not that Sasuke didn't deserve it. But twelve-year-old Sasuke had not done what his future counterpart had done, yet. Naruto had been unfair to the boy. He would talk to Sasuke, but he wasn't going to like it. And he definitely was not going to tell him about Itachi, not now. So what happens now? Lee finally asked, his obsidian eyes flitting between Naruto and Shikamaru. The Nara genius let out a long breath, imagining that he was blowing out smoke after taking a nice drag on his cigarette. We wait to see the changes we have wrought. Mendokus. I couldn't agree more. Uchiha Sasuke was, as he said so himself, an avenger. He wanted to avenge his clan and kill Itachi to prove to his brother that he was the stronger of the two. But he wasn't sure what would happen after he had accomplished his goal. The scenario had played out in his head so many times. He would confront Itachi, his true strength playing out in his eyes with the Sharingan activated. They would stare at each other with those identical cursed eyes, and then the battle would take place. In his head, it would always end with him standing over Itachi's dying corpse, who would be pleading for mercy. Sasuke would just scoff and say, Did our parents beg for you to stop? Did you give them any mercy? No? Well then I shall do the same. But what came after those accursed eyes of his brothers would close forever? Sasuke wanted, needed to rebuild the Uchiha clan so that it could regain its glory. Would he be satisfied with accepting the fact that he had destroyed the biggest traitor to Kanoha? No. He wouldn't do it for Kanoha, he held no attachment to this place. He would do it for himself. Everything that he had done up until now had been for himself, not for anyone else. Mind if I join you? A voice from his right asked quietly. Sasuke's jaw twitched. Why did he know where Sasuke's favorite spot was? Because it's one of mine too. Watching the sun dip down below the horizon is beautiful from this vantage point. 
The Uchiha nearly squirmed when he realized that he had spoken aloud. Turning to the source of the voice, he didn't stop the scowl that was already halfway on his face. Dope. Team. His blonde teammate responded in kind, sitting down on the soft grass of the hill that overlooked the west side of Kanoha. It truly had the best view. None of them spoke for quite some time, which gave Sasuke a chance to examine the person sitting next to him. He had known Naruto since the academy, so for about six years, but never had he seen him like this. Quiet and calm and strong. With Naruto, it was all about the adrenaline rush, the jumpiness, the hyperactivity. The one who rushed into situations head first and thought of the consequences later. Sasuke grudgingly admitted to himself that he didn't know Naruto very well, despite being his teammate for the past three months, almost four now. But he didn't know anyone, not even himself. Clearly, Naruto wasn't what people thought he was. Sasuke wasn't blind. He had seen the glares, the whispers, he had also seen the way the dobe's shoulders slumped slightly as he heard the insults before grinning wildly. Masks are a part of life. You just have to know when to do wear the right one. Sasuke said, letting the wind carry his voice out. Beside him, Naruto's eyes widened. How did you get so strong, Dobe? There was no malice in the Uchiha's voice, just curiosity. You were the dead last, and then yesterday. Sasuke trailed off. Everyone had been talking about what had happened during the exam, but no one was sure as to what had happened. The Dobe and his two friends had done something that was supposed to be impossible for someone of their age, or at least that's what the older ninjas were saying. Sasuke didn't see Naruto grimace, or how his eyes had become contemplative. I was strong from the start, Sasuke. Emotionally strong, if not physically. At the Uchiha's blank stare, Naruto snorted. Your comment about masks. I'm assuming you've realized that everything that you think you know about me is false. Then you know the villagers hate me? As to why, well, maybe I'll tell you later. Sasuke, though he kept his face emotionless, was starting to get engrossed in the tale of Uzumaki Naruto. H.N. I had to rise above the hate so that I would come out on top. All those pranks, they were a cry for attention so that someone would acknowledge my presence. Even bad attention is attention nonetheless. The bitter tone in Naruto's voice was something that Sasuke could relate to. But he hadn't wanted attention, he got it anyway. The only thing he had wanted was to be left alone, while Naruto wanted someone to be there for him. Two sides of the same coins. Perhaps they were more alike than Sasuke had first imagined. Both were orphans, both only relied on themselves, both kept their true feelings below multitudes of illusions. It was then that Sasuke truly observed the Uzumaki boy. His hair had grown so that his bangs covered his eyes. The orange jumpsuit was gone, replaced by a casual clothing, just a plain black t-shirt with matching pants, and his shinobi holster around his left leg. As to how I became strong, Naruto stretched his legs, watching the brilliant hues of the sky as it began its transition from afternoon to evening. I practiced. Sasuke snorted. There's more to that, I'm sure. Tell me. The blonde boy gave him a look. Ask nicely, and I might. Sasuke kept his mouth shut, but his eyes revealed that he actually wanted to know. After a few uncomfortable moments of silence, Naruto sighed deeply. Always the emotionless bastard I see. He grinned when Sasuke bristled. Look, strength is a relative concept, and it is something that cannot be measured. Even the weakest person has strength. But that strength, no matter what type it is, has to be brought forth in order for that person to become stronger. That made no sense. Sasuke did pan. Strength needs a trigger. Naruto said carefully. You're a genius, Sasuke, but are you strong? Onyx eyes met clear blue ones. Naruto could clearly see Sasuke's emotions. Curiosity, pain, resentment, and everything in between. 
Of course I'm strong. I was the rookie of the E dash. Sasuke fell backward onto the soft grass with a thump, his eyes wide. He couldn't feel the bottom half of his body. Naruto stood over him, two fingers outstretched, a frown on his face. When had Naruto moved? Being rookie of the year doesn't mean that you are strong, Sasuke. Sakura was the smartest girl in our class, but look at her, she's weak. She doesn't have the same drive that the rest of our graduating class does. Even Ino is stronger than Sakura. What she needs is the proper guidance to become stronger, a trigger. In a flash, Naruto had unparalyzed Sasuke's body and let him sit up shakily. What happened to your clan was terrible, but the path that you are walking down is dangerous. If you let your hatred for your brother consume you, then no one will be able to save you. Your trigger for strength is anger, revenge. Change it, and then perhaps you'll find true strength. Sasuke tensed. The dope had no right to lecture him. His entire family hadn't been destroyed by one man. A man who Sasuke had respected more than anything in the world. What could he know about losing family? The look of pity that Naruto shot him, though, told Sasuke that Naruto knew exactly what he was thinking and what he felt like. Do what you want, Sasuke, but don't think that I didn't warn you. There was something in the dobe's eyes that sent a shiver down Sasuke's spine. But remember, every story has two sides to it. It would be best if you would hear both before going down the path that you choose. Looking past the silent boy, Naruto smirked at something that only he could see. His work here was done. Giving Sasuke a slight wave, he vanished in a swirl of leaves. Sasuke sat where he was, watching the last of the leaves fall to the ground. Naruto's words, they had sounded so wise. The boy's words has been a warning of sorts. As he slowly stood up, he was unaware of a raven that flew off into the darkening sky from the treetops above, with three spinning tomos in both eyes. In Nami no Kuni, a tall man with startling red eyes held out a finger for his faithful raven to use as a perch. Those red eyes widened slightly as he obtained the information that his spy had collected for him. A barely their smile covered his face, his cloak masking it from his rather blue partner. The two of them were preparing to go to Kanoha in order to investigate a very special boy that their leader had heard of. Apparently, a foreign shinobi had sent word of this boy to his kage, and the rumors had began. If this boy was indeed who their leader thought he was, then it was imperative to gather information on him. When their leader had gotten word of this, he had kindly asked the man and his partner to validate the claims that were being made. As the two of them entered the land of Wave, the tall man stopped for a second, and the barely there smile on his face was moved up to a nearly there smile. Something wrong, Itachi? The man's blue partner asked, noticing the slight change in the Uchiha. The sword on his back glinted in the soft moonlight. But Uchiha Itachi said nothing, he only continued to walk forward. The blue man, whose name was Hashigaki Kisame, shook his head, but followed after the stoic man. He never noticed the placard that was to their right. The one that said, The Great Naruto Bridge. The blade glinted in the harsh sunlight, blood dripping off of it, creating a crimson pool that seeped into the ground. A woman, lying on the ground, her throat slit. Warm blood still gushing from the wound. Hysterical laughter coming from above her. A man, with raven hair and crimson eyes, holding the wicked blade to have done the deed. A flash of gold, pounding feet, cries of disbelief. Hot tears mingling with the blood below. You see Naruto. Uchiha Sasuke screamed. The woman who claimed to have loved me is dead. By my own hand. Did you know that she even wanted to leave Kanoha with me when I first left? Blue eyes, icier than the coldest parts of snow country, glared at the Uchiha, hot tears coming down his face. She was our teammate. She loved you. You bastard. How could you have done this? More laughter. I know she loved me. 
And look how I repaid her. The bloody sword pointed to the flower-shaped pattern of blood on the woman's chest. The place where her heart was. She wanted me to take her heart, right? Red eyes burned with madness. So I did. A blue sphere of pure rage. Red eyes widening as the sphere crashed into their owner's chest. More blood spattering. This isn't over, Dove. A cough, followed by a puff of smoke. No it isn't, team. No it isn't. Knees hitting the ground, fists pounding into the dirt. Agony. Dead green eyes. Accusing him. Saying, why didn't you save me, Naruto? Why couldn't you save me? I'm sorry, Sakura-chan. I'm so sorry. Gentle hands pulling him back, soothing his pain. naruto Kuen. There's nothing more that can be done. I'm so sorry. Naruto jolted awake, cold sweat pouring down his shuddering body. Icy and hot flashes ran through him, which caused him to shiver even more. This was the first time he had had a nightmare of the war since arriving to the past. But that particular one, of Sakura's death, that was one of his recurring night terrors since she had died. He had wounded Sasuke grievously with his patented attack, but couldn't find the strength to end it all right there, not with Sakura's dead body lying on the ground, so pale, so, still. Swinging his legs over the bed, he stood shakily using the wall as support. Judging by the lightning sky that he could see through the window, it was close to dawn. Naruto sat on the floor with a soft thud. The cold, wooden floor that was unique to the Nara clan comforted him and cooled his body down. He still couldn't believe that he had his own room in the clan. Yoshino-san had all but forced him and Lee to choose the two conveniently empty rooms next to Shikamaru's. And for that, he was eternally grateful. His own apartment, the one that he visited about once a week, could probably fit within this room. With the Naras, he and Lee were treated just like Shikamaru was. They weren't guests anymore, they were just permanent fixtures who made the lazy household a bit more exciting. Naruto closed his eyes, evening out his breathing. In. Out. Push. Pull. In. Yang. He could feel the natural energy around him, thrumming with life, vibrant, beautiful. The feel of the pure chakra threatened to overwhelm him. How long had it been since he had entered sage mode? He had only tried it once since arriving back to the past. Naruto could hear Shikamaru's heartbeat pounding steadily in the next room. The rhythm flowed with Naruto's breathing, and brought a small smile to the blonde's face. Abruptly, he stopped gathering chakra. It wasn't that he couldn't, but now was not the right time. Now was the time to think ahead, to anticipate the enemy's attack, and create a counter. Naruto sighed and ruffled his already disheveled hair. Plans and strategy were more Shikamaru's area of expertise. Over the years he himself had become quite good at creating them, but no one could beat Shikamaru when he was in his element. Standing up, he stretched all the kinks out of his body. Ah, that felt quite good. His body felt nimble and supple, the way a shinobi's body should feel like. Ichem. The sky was changing hues quickly. Maybe he would take a quick jog around the village before coming back home for breakfast. A sardonic and surprised laugh escaped Naruto. He thought of this place as home, not just some residence where he slept, ate, and did his business. This was home. With that thought in mind, Naruto gleefully vanished in a puff of smoke, his body shaking with energy. Yakushi Kabuto was annoyed. Ever since he had left the Chunin exams prematurely, he had become slightly paranoid. It was bad enough that Uchiha Sasuke had escaped their grasp courtesy of those three pesky genin, but now he felt as though he was being watched. Of course, Perhaps this feeling stemmed from the fact that in one month, Kanoha was going to be turned upside down thanks to them. Perhaps a little paranoia was a good thing. However, 
it honestly did seem as though someone was watching him. He walked to the hospital in relative silence, the steady pounding of his sandal-clad feet on the ground below steadying his heart rate. It was only six in the morning so barely anyone was on the streets at this hour. He smiled politely at a buxom middle-aged lady who managed a fruit stall who, to his revulsion, sent him a sultry smile. Entering the hospital, he signed in and went about carrying his duties as if he wasn't planning an attack on Kanoha. All the while, he didn't notice a masked face silently recording all of his actions down to the minutest of details. Naruto's jog ended at the memorial stone. He didn't know why he was so drawn to this particular place, but his feet had dragged him here. The stone was, a reminder. The boy clenched his fists. Yes. This stone was one hell of a reminder of what was to come, and what could not come. After the war had started, there had been too many names to carve, so they had stuck with tallies instead. But after a while, there had just been too many of those tallies as well. And then the stone itself had been destroyed by Uchiha Abito himself. Right after he had tortured Kakashi to death. Tears rose to Naruto's eyes as he thought of Kakashi's death, of his mutilated body. But they never fell. They wouldn't fall. All of a sudden, Naruto stiffened before relaxing imperceptibly. Now I see why you get lost on the road of life, sensei. From behind him, Kakashi chuckled and walked forward so that he stood right next to Naruto. One hand lazily found its place on top of the teen's head. Fancy seeing you here, Naruto. In all honesty, Kakashi was surprised. He had been doing this little morning ritual for nearly twelve years now, and so far, Naruto had been the first to intercept that routine. Naruto shrugged, but Kakashi could see the look in the boy's eyes. It was one that he knew himself. Regret. Wistfulness. Want. Sadness. Guilt. A twelve-year-old child should not have the eyes of a seasoned soldier like himself. Who? The Cyclops blinked. I'm sorry. Naruto let out a long-suffering sigh. Who is it that you mourn? This person must have been incredibly close to your heart for you to take the time to just stare at this stone for hours on end before coming to training ground 7, or whatever else you do on your off days. Kakashi idly ruffled Naruto's hair, thinking what his response to that would be. Naruto on the other hand, was inwardly cursing Achiha Abito with every fiber of his being. His name was Abito, and he was an Achiha, and my teammate. Kakashi finally said, closing his eyes in pain of the memory of his greatest rival. And for a while, you reminded me of him. Naruto flinched. Perhaps before Abito had turned evil, he and the Uchiha did have things in common, but Naruto never equated the younger version of Abito to the Abito that he knew and despised. Kakashi, who was oblivious to the turmoil he was causing Naruto, continued. He wasn't stuck up like the other Uchihas, you know. He was, loud. And for the longest time, I hated him. The blonde boy sat down, and his sensei copied him. Kakashi gave Naruto a wan smile. Before, I compared him to you, but now, I think you're a bit too much like me. Naruto pulled at the grass beneath him, taken aback by Kakashi's comment. What do you mean? It was the first time that he had been compared to Kakashi. Usually, it was his dad, his mom. Or Jiraiya, or even the Shodame, but this was a first. If anything, Naruto could draw the similarities between Sasuke and Kakashi. The Cyclops pulled at his mask. We hide our true natures. Me, behind this mask and my books, and you beneath the orange jumpsuit you wore, the pranks, the hyperactivity. He chanced a glance at Naruto. His sensei's son looked stoic, but Kakashi could tell he was affected by his words. Your dad was so open, so unguarded, well, until we were on the battlefield of course. Now that got a reaction out of Naruto who looked up. Really? Kakashi's visible eye glimmered with warmth. 
really. To tell you the truth, when you, sealed, the Achibi, I think everyone watching was reminded of Minato Sensei. The commanding tone of your voice, your confidence, the way that Shikamaru and Lee followed your orders, it was as if you had become Hokage for a bit. Naruto chortled uncomfortably. Wasn't that the truth? But your laugh, your ramen addiction, the energy that you have, the pranks, now that's all Kushin and Asan. Naruto smiled a true smile, one that reminded Kakashi of his sensei. You called her Nesan. Kakashi ran a hand through his hair. She didn't give me much of a choice. He closed his eyes, remembering how the redhead had pretty much threatened him to call her Nesan with a kunai in one hand, and a large whisk in the other. She was making omelettes for the entire team, if he recalled correctly. In his mind, Naruto could picture that scene happening. He had heard how scary his mother could be with her flaming red hair. His mother had told him that she had been nicknamed Tomato in the academy due to that red hair, and how her temper had eventually earned her the moniker, the red hot-blooded habanero. It was ironic really. Yellow and red made orange. Him. So Ka-san was violent. Naruto asked innocently, noticing Kakashi's shiver. To say the least. Kakashi grinned. She had a temper, that's for sure, but she was also probably the strongest and scariest woman I had the privilege of meeting. Actually, she and Tsunade-sama had many things in common now that I think about it. It runs in the blood. Naruto snorted. Isn't that the truth? Kakashi lay back on the ground, enjoying the silence that his companion provided him with. If someone would have told him when he had first taken Team 7, that Uzumaki Naruto would one day be sitting with him by the memorial stone, quiet as a, shinobi, he would have shown them his face. However, observing the young man besides him, Kakashi realized that perhaps this quiet nature of Naruto's, it might actually be his real one. Yes. The soft smile on his face, the understanding in his eyes, it was as if Naruto was a completely new person. You won't be training me. It wasn't a question, it was a statement. The grey-haired man shook his head ruefully. Jiraiya-sama has already claimed you. He snorted. But, seeing as to what you did in the forest, and during the preliminaries, I highly doubt that you need much training. Sasuke is lucky to have you teaching him. Naruto murmured softly, noting that Kakashi didn't so much as blink when he said that. A stray leaf landed on Naruto's blonde hair, yellow and green clashing. He deftly snatched it in his fingers, and twirled it, marveling in the subtle patterns that the veins made. Nature was truly beautiful. Naruto, why don't you come with me? Kakashi declared suddenly, holding out his hand to the genin. The boy looked at his sensei's extended hand with some reluctance. He was rather hungry, and the Nara clan truly had excellent food. Come on. I'll even throw in breakfast. Kakashi coaxed him with his signature eye smile. Naruto shook his head in exasperation but said nothing as the older man took hold of him. Without another word, they vanished in a poof of smoke. Only to reappear in Kakashi's apartment. Naruto bit back the feelings of nostalgia. He had been here a couple times, discussing missions and the like. It hadn't changed at all. There was still the picture of the previous Team 7 in the foyer. His gaze lingered on his father the longest. They really did look alike. He astutely ignored Abito's smiling face, and disregarded the similarities between this picture, and the one of the current Team 7 that was gathering dust in Naruto's barely used apartment. That picture had been taken after the mission to wave, when the members of that team had built an unstable friendship. You're not some type of pedophile, are you sensei? Naruto deadpanned, enjoying when Kakashi stumbled and sputtered. What are you talking about? Naruto just shrugged, having a bit too much fun torturing the poor man. I mean, what sensei brings a kid to his apartment this early in the morning with absolutely no warning, without having some kind of ulterior motive. 
Heck, you even lured me here with food. It's not candy, but it's close enough. Not to mention the time when you poked me in the butt with that ridiculous and somewhat disturbing move when we first fought. If Kakashi hadn't caught the amusement in Naruto's eyes, he would have believed him. Instead, he let out a breath and fastened the boy with a glare. You really had me going there for a second, brat. But you're right, I do have an ulterior motive. The man disappeared into his bedroom for a second, only to come back with a package in his hand. He gave it to Naruto, who was staring at it with open curiosity. What is it? Open it. Kakashi said, standing back. Naruto did as he was told, and furiously stamped down the emotions that were threatening to rise to the surface when he saw what his present was. A photo album. Kakashi watched as the emotions that Naruto was desperately trying to cover escaped. With a sad sigh, the Jonin confirmed to himself that Naruto was more like him than he had thought. Now that you know your parentage, it's only right that I gave this to you. Kakashi said softly, leading the teen into the kitchen where they both slumped into chairs. Shaky fingers opened the first page. Naruto's breath caught in his throat as he gazed at the first picture with longing. It was of his mother with Tsunade Bachan who looked the same as she did now. This picture must have been twenty years old. A teenage Kushina had her arms wrapped around Tsunade's waist, while the older woman had her arm draped over Kushina's shoulder. Naruto traced his mother's smile, memorizing it, copying it, committing it to memory. Kushina really was beautiful. Both of them were. He didn't realize just how close his mother and Tsunade were. The second picture was of his father and Jiraiya. Naruto stifled a snort at the picture. His father looked distressed at the fact that Jiraiya had Minato in a headlock. Both of these pictures were taken before the war began. Minato-sensei and Nei-san were nineteen. Kakashi murmured quietly. Nineteen. I became Hokage at that age. Naruto thought dispassionately. I never thought I would say this brat, but you matured quicker than anyone in the previous generation, or even your own. It's amazing when you think about it. You started off as a naive, stubborn, pathetic shinobi, and look what you turned into. Kurama added his own two cents in, licking his paw lazily. Yeah well. A bitter smile crossed Naruto's face. Desperate times called for desperate measures. The blonde teen turned the page, a delighted expression lighting up his face. The next picture was one of Minato and Kushina together. Both of them had small blushes on their faces, and they were holding hands. Naruto looked to Kakashi expectantly who chuckled. Ah, I remember that picture. I took it. Minato-sensei had pretty much confessed to the world that he loved Nei-san, and that he would die if she said no to him. Kakashi smirked. Actually, that's something I can picture you doing. Naruto ignored the blush that was rising to his own cheeks, and focused on the warm sensation in his stomach that had nothing to do with Kurama. His dad had been a romantic, eh? Kushina Nei-san had been dead embarrassed because Sensei had decided that the best time to confess his undying love was in the middle of the market, during the busiest time of day. Me and Jiraiya-sama had been following the two of them that day, and there was a bet going on among the Jonans as to who would confess first. I distinctly recall Nei-san freezing in the street, and everyone staring at her. Then, her face turned the most interesting shade of red that I have ever seen before she promptly walked over to your dad, bopped him over the head, and pulled him into a kiss which had the entire street jumping for joy. Kakashi snickered gleefully. I also won a thousand yen that day. Naruto couldn't help but bursting into uncontrollable laughter as he pictured that scene. I assume he was teased mercilessly. The evil glint in Kakashi's eyes had Naruto doubled over. Oh you have no idea. There was just so much blackmail material. A pleasant silence descended over the kitchen table as Naruto flicked through more photos. There were some of Jiraiya and Tsunade, 
but most of them were of Team 7, Minato, and Kushina. That is, until Naruto got near the end. Sensei. Hmm. Why are there pictures of me? And indeed, there were several pictures of baby Naruto with the Sandame, with the ANBU squad that looked over him. Naruto distinctly recognized the hair of Uchiha Itachi and Yuzuki Yugao in the ANBU squad along with Kakashi and two were more pictures with Kakashi, and with some select jonin like Genma, Asuma, and Gai. And then there were the random photos of him that looked like they had been taken from a distance as Naruto was pulling a prank, as he was eating ramen, as he was being punished for something at the academy. Naruto's eyes narrowed as they met Kakashi's who cringed slightly. The older man sheepishly grinned at the teen who looked thoroughly unimpressed. Were you stalking me? I wouldn't call it stalking per se, I was just, looking after you. By taking pictures of me when I wasn't looking? Naruto asked, incredulous. He knew Kakashi cared for him, but seriously? This was creepy. When Kakashi didn't answer, Naruto sighed and turned the page. Big mistake. What the hell is that? What is WHO? Kakashi concealed a snicker. Naruto pointed a trembling finger at Kakashi in accusation. How could you allow this, this monstrosity to be taken? Kakashi could no longer hide his sheer amusement at Naruto's outraged face. Ma, ma, it's not so bad. Yeah right. Not so bad my ass. The blonde stood up. Look at this. He shook the album violently. I'm green. He sat back down, pouting and very angry. The older man clutched at his stomach as he broke out into a fit of giggles and chuckles which caused Naruto to look at him fondly, despite his annoyance with everything in the world at the moment. When was the last time he had heard Kakashi's laughter? Not for a long time. Still, the source of the man's amusement was not very funny to him. The picture in question was one of Naruto and Guy. Naruto must have been no older than two, and dressed in green spandex. His thumb was outstretched like Guy's was, and both toddler and adult were smiling, displaying all the teeth that they had. In Naruto's case, it was a total of about five. Who in their right minds had let him be dressed in spandex? Underneath the picture was a caption that read Baby Naruto and Guy. Taken by Kakashi. Just because I was too young to know what was going on did not mean that you had the right to torture me. Naruto grumbled, crossing his arms rather petulantly. So I guess I shouldn't mention when we dressed you up in fishnets and paraded you around ANBU headquarters as Anko's apprentice? If looks could kill, Kakashi would be dead ten times over. Breakfast. The older man simply giggled again as he dodged a kunai and went to go put rice in the cooker. Chojuro Kun. An exuberant woman sang cheerfully as she pranced her way through the office of the Mizukage. The short swordsman gulped slightly as he walked into the Mizukage's private room, ready to take on whatever Meisama threw at him. Chirumi Mei, the most powerful woman in Kiri, was gleeful when she had read the message from A.O. that had arrived yesterday afternoon. It had taken three times of rereading it to get over the shock of A.O.'s message, but once the shock was gone, pure happiness remained. M. Mesama. The man bowed low, hoping that she wasn't going to dump paperwork on him, again. Guess what? She nearly glomped him, but decided against it at the last minute. Chojuro honestly had no idea what she was so happy about. Um, did one of our genin make it to the finals of the Chunin exams? The woman shook her head, the smile still firmly planted on her face. Nope. They all lost. Guess again. The man resisted the urge to plant his face in his palms. A, Aosan found a wife. The cheerful atmosphere vanished instantly replaced by something menacing enough to make anyone want to wet themselves. Chojuro cringed, fully expecting to be melted by lava. No. I, I don't know, Meisama. Once again, 
there was a smile on May's face. I found that I have another cousin. And he's Kushin and san's son. That threw Chojuro for a loop. He was one of the few who knew that Mei was part of the Uzumaki clan, and her relation to Uzumaki Kushina. But to think that Kushina-sama had a son? His name is Uzumaki Naruto. He's twelve, a genin, and absolutely adorable. Look! Mei picked up a picture off of the desk and thrust it in Chojuro's face. It was of Ao and a blonde boy who Chojuro assumed was this Uzumaki Naruto. With spiky blonde hair, a warm smile, and brilliant blue eyes, the Chunin was reminded of pictures of the Yandame Hokage. Chojuro paled. Uzumaki Naruto. Uzumaki Kushina. Namike's Minato. Those two had been the same age. There were rumors that she had been romantically involved with him. That scary resemblance. This kid was the son of the Yandame. Well, there was a 99.99% .99 chance that he was right about that. We're going to Kanoha to see my baby cousin kick some butt for the finals. May pranced around the room, carrying the picture around. Chojuro just nodded numbly and walked out of the room. Life had just gotten a bit more interesting. Jiraiya observed his godson as he sat lazily on the water, waiting for further instruction. They were at training ground 18 right now, the one wick was closest to the river that ran through Kanoha. Jiraiya had promised to show him super cool and totally awesome jutsus if he displayed impressive chakra control. Which Naruto had just done. Though Jiraiya loathed to do it, he couldn't help but compare Naruto to Minato. They were both his students after all. Minato had been a genius but from what he had heard of what Naruto had done at the exams, Naruto was well on his way of surpassing his father, even at this tender age. TCH. Naruto frowned. Arojiji, this is boring. Now that brought a tick to Jiraiya's jaw. Call me Arojiji one more time Gaki, and I'll make you sit here the entire day. The Senin growled without any heat. Naruto just smirked at him, practically using confidence. E-R-O-J-I-J-I. Brat. Jiraiya's voice held the smallest amount of ire. After a minute of just staring at each other, the sage just sighed and copied his godson by sitting on the water. Can you teach me to summon? Naruto asked quietly, startling the older man slightly. I want to carry on Tusan's legacy, and that means that I will learn summoning and the Raisin the future Hokage's tone gave no room for dissent. Jiraiya stared at the boy before smirking. That fire in his eye, that was all Minato right there. I don't see why not. In one swift motion, the scroll off of Jiraiya's back unsealed itself and plopped onto dry ground, unfurling as it came to rest. Now, Naruto had fully expected to see his name on the scroll, knowing that summoning was not constricted by time and space, and therefore was slightly taken aback when the last name to have been signed was Namike's Minato. Bounding over to the scroll, he knelt by it, tracing over his father's name in reverence, something that Jiraiya didn't miss. The scroll must be signed in blood, so dash. Naruto had already sliced his hand open and was currently making a big show of once again becoming a toad summoner. When his signature was complete, it felt as though a missing part of him had been restored. Jiraiya looked slightly bemused, but beamed proudly at Naruto's wide grin. Do you know the seals for the jutsu? Naruto shook his head, deciding to dumb himself down a bit. All right, watch carefully then. Since our toad summons are made through a blood contract, in order to summon them, blood must be present. So prick one of your fingers or something. The first seal is the boar seal which goes to dog, to bird, to monkey, to ram. Then, slam your palm onto the ground, and shout Kuchios no Jutsu, and depending on your control and output of chakra, the toad of your choosing will appear. So you mean the more chakra I put in, the larger the toad? Naruto placed a finger on his chin, tapping it thoughtfully. 
It was fun to see his sensei in sensei mode instead of pervert mode. Not necessarily larger, Jiraiya corrected, but more powerful. He clapped his hands together, a smile on his face. So, give it a try. Eagerly, Naruto ran through the seals with ease, not noticing the narrowing of Jiraiya's eyes, and slammed his bloody palm on the ground, inwardly praying that he didn't summon Gamakichi, or Gamabunta for that matter. Naruto didn't have to worry though, because the second he shouted out Kuchiyos no Jutsu, he promptly vanished in a poof of smoke, leaving behind a dumbfounded Jiraiya. The Senin stared at the spot where his godson had vanished from in disbelief. The toads had reverse summoned Naruto. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. The first thing that Naruto saw was the smiling faces of Fukasaku and Shima, or better known as Ma and Pa, which caused him to scramble backwards. He had been reverse summoned. But why? Um. It's good to see you, Naruto-chan. Fukasaku aimed a kick at his head which Naruto deftly sidestepped. You too. The blonde muttered, politely turning down a bowl of worms that Shima had thrust in his face. Naruto breathed in the fresh air of empty Mayaboku, reveling in the energy that it was engulfed in. He closed his eyes, enhancing his senses as he did so. Kami. He could be lost in admiring this haven for the rest of his life. Smack. His admiration was cut short as he hit the ground rather hard and massaged his sore jaw. The elder toad looked quite proud of himself for landing a slap on the daydreaming man slash boy. What was that for? Naruto grumbled, picking himself off the ground. Pay attention, Naruto-chan. Pa pointed to straight ahead. The Agama Senin asterisk has called for you. Naruto immediately schooled his features into those of utter and complete respect. Ojiji-sama, eh? He has seen new visions of the future that you and your comrades altered, and Ojiji-sama would like you to be the first one to hear them. The time traveler was on high alert. New visions. The last time he had been summoned to hear new visions was very close to when the trio had gone back in time. Ojiji-sama had seen flames and death, and Naruto had all but lost hope by that point. If the elder toad sage indeed had seen something other than death, there in itself was the proof that the future had been changed. As the trio walked to the Agama Senin's throne room, Naruto let a soft smile overtake his features. This place had been where he had changed, become stronger, taken on the mantle of a Senin after his sensei had passed on to the other world. It was a reminder of everything he had striven to be. It was comfort. It was pain. It was sadness. It was joy. It was his paradise. Fukasaku took a look at the man turned boy's peaceful face. A soft yet heavy sigh escaped the sage. The toads had all felt the shift when Naruto had performed the jutsu that had brought him and his companions back in time. The bond between summon and summoner was born of blood. Naruto's blood tied him to them. Of course, it was the first time in history had performed time travel, therefore the effects of such a jutsu on summons had not been documented. Nothing had changed. Well, almost nothing. The toad still remembered what had happened as if it was yesterday, which in the beginning, it was. Their bodies hadn't changed. Of course, it was the younger generation, Gamakichi and Gamatatsu, who had grown immensely since Naruto had first summoned them. Those who had died, had come back. Jeratora, who had perished two years after the war had started, had awakened all of them with a large cry, followed by several croaks as he burst into the Agama Senin's chambers, shocking all those present. When they finally realized what had happened, tears were shed, mothers embraced lost children, husbands and wives reunited, families were complete once again. And it was all thanks to the man who walked besides Fukasaku. Naruto stopped in front of the large area which housed the great toad sage, a feeling of nostalgia and anxiousness running through him. The guards greeted him as if he was an old friend, and they entered the throne room. 
This reminds me of Rikudo Gigi's place. Kurama remarked lazily, licking a paw. His jailer nearly tripped over his feet at the sound of the fox's voice. I'm really feeling the love, brat. He said with dry amusement. Shut up. Naruto shot back with no real ire. Wait, what do you mean? Kurama sighed loudly. Rikudo Gigi had a giant house where all of us used to stay. Before you say anything, we were pretty small back then, so we fit. This room reminds me of where the old man used to practice his fuenjutsu and what not. Naruto had nothing more to say, so he simply nodded, and trained his eyes on the elderly toad sitting on the giant throne. It had been too long, Ojiji-sama. I thank you for summoning me. The Hokage bowed low, with Ma and Pa following him. The toad peered down at Naruto, a smile on his weathered and wart-filled face. It was indeed I who summoned you. A look of confusion overtook his face. Who are you again? There was a moment of silence before Naruto laughed softly. So much had changed, but some things just stayed the same. It's me, Namike's Naruto, Rokadame Hokage, and Jinchuriki of the Kyubi, Ojiji-sama. A great rumble was heard from the elderly toad as he locked eyes with the teen. Ah yes. Now I remember. The child of the prophecy. Unwittingly, a small smile made its way onto Naruto's face. It had been quite some time since someone had called him by that particular moniker. But that smile quickly faded down into a controlled grimace. Some savior I was. Kurama sighed in exasperation. The brat did this all the time. Self-loathing. It was a gift that Mito and Kushina had perfected as well, although all three of them had hit it quite well. Naruto had the most guilt on his shoulders. Some part of his jailer, his partner, housed the burden of the Fourth World War. They died protecting me was the prevalent thought that the brat had had, especially when Hugo Niji had passed on. That had been the first death from the kid's friend circle, and predictably, the hardest. Snap out of it. Kurama grumbled, a bit harsher than intended. Naruto stood in silence for a second before nodding ever so slightly and diverting his full attention to the old toad. I have had many visions, my boy. Please listen to them carefully. The wizened toad stated, coughing slightly. The child of the prophecy has changed reality, and in doing so, hope has been restored. The blonde sage nodded, ignoring the lump in his throat. However, obstacles will be thrown his way, sooner than he expects. The lump grew smaller as Naruto steeled his nerves. Yes. He had expected this. Ever since Gara had been miraculously given back his memories, he had expected this. The ripples had been made, and now, all they could do was prepare for the tsunami that was coming. The sly fox will be joined by the wise deer and firm turtle. At Naruto's amused snort, Shima and Fukusaku looked at him quizzically, to which he simply shook his head. Deer and turtle, eh? Shika and Lee would be pleased, no doubt. Together the three of them will fight as one, as brothers, as kin. The octopus and raccoon will be their greatest allies, but they will fall if the crimson-eyed fiends are not stopped. If the moon vanishes, the sun cannot do its job. The tides will not be controlled. Darkness will reign, and snakes will plague the land. Cerulean eyes narrowed. Ojiji-sama's vision left no ambiguity as to what was going to happen. But what was it that the toad had said? Snakes will plague the land? Could that be referring to Orochimaru, Kabuto, or Sasuke, or all three? Madara's eye of the moon plan would become a reality if they didn't stop it. Mugen Tsukiyomi Infinite Tsukiyomi The world's most powerful Jinjutsu That was what Madara and Abito wanted to shroud the world with to create a perfect society. However, a utopia is, in itself, a dystopia. They are two sides of the same coin. Enemies will become friends. And friends will become enemies. 
Beware the cursed eyes. They shall be the harbinger of pain. Naruto closed his eyes. He had an inkling as to who was going to become an enemy. Most of what the toad had said were things that he had already known. The last sentence, though, they shall be the harbinger of pain. Pain? Or pain? Nagato. His distant clansman, the one who carried the Rinnegan. The great toad sage blinked twice before a wan smile covered his face. Naruto-chan, for now, that is it. I sense that more visions will come in the future. Keep in mind, your enemies can become stronger than before in a quicker time. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It made sense too. The three of them, himself, Shikamaru, and Lee, had come back with the knowledge of the future as well as their powers. If all three of them had been above Kage level, then, to keep the balance, their enemies would also have to become stronger. The fact that Naruto had seen one of Itachi's ravens the other day proved to him that Akatsuki would be making a move sooner. That raven had no doubt been a warning for the Sandame. If Nagato had dispatched Itachi, and most likely Kisame as well, then it meant that Abito was already pulling the strings, and it meant that they were getting suspicious. It was foreboding. Arigato, Ojiji-sama. Naruto bowed low, a frown on his face. I shall keep what you have just told me in mind. Naruto-chan. Fukasaku sighed at the boy. Did you understand that? The Rokudame Hokage nodded tersely, slumping his shoulders as he did so. Yes. What will you tell Jiraiya-chan? Shima inquired, changing the subject, eager to see that child again after six long years. At that, Naruto groaned. I can't tell him that I made a mistake. He was right there. I'm pretty sure if you would correct me if I had done something wrong. The team ran a weary hand over his face. I hate lying to him of all people, but I suppose half-truths are the way to go. Should we come with you? Fukasaku asked in concern. Naruto smiled ever so slightly. I'll let you all have your reunion in private. For now, I think I should go back. Aerojiji seems lazy, but I do know that he goes a bit frantic if I go missing for a long period of time. He thought back to the three glorious years he had spent with that man. It was true. Naruto had once strayed away from the man in a forest near Waterfall Country to pee in private, and Jiraiya had knocked down half the trees in the area just to find his godson. You'll think of something, Naruto-chan. The sage said wisely with a rueful shake of his head. You always did have the uncanny ability to improvise on the spot. What did they call you? The most unpredictable ninja or something like that? Said unpredictable ninja snorted with amusement. Warmth coated his eyes as he stared at the bright sky, a nostalgic expression on his face. Something like that. And then, just as he had arrived, the toad sage vanished in a puff of smoke. Jiraiya had been tempted to summon a toad, just to see what the hell his godson was doing in the realm of the summons. That summoning hadn't been accidental. He knew accidental summoning. That was how he had discovered the toads in the first place. The toads had called Naruto there for a specific purpose. So lost was he in his frantic thoughts that he didn't hear the quiet popping noise behind him. Oi, Arojiji. Jiraiya whirled around, relief displayed clearly on his face. Naruto. He watched as the boy walked up to him, an exasperated look plastered all over his face. So the toads are really nice. Naruto stated plainly, taking in the dumbstruck look that Jiraiya was wearing. It looked rather good on him, in Naruto's humble opinion. Huh? Was the older man's eloquent reply. The toads, you know, the warty ones, the ones that I signed a contract with? The kid smirked. They're pretty cool. What did, what did they say? Jiraiya questioned, fishing for information. Reverse summoning wasn't common amongst any summons. They just wanted to say hi. Naruto replied jauntily, grinning. Probably wanted to meet the person they would be bound to. 
I wonder if they did that with Tuchan too. He paused, honestly wondering if they had. Jiraiya stared at the kid for a minute before shaking his head. No, they didn't. In fact, I don't remember if any of us were reverse summoned. Hey! Naruto pretended to ponder something. Did Dad ever become a sage? Like you? Because the Toad said that they were going to start training me to become one. At that statement, Jiraiya gaped at the boy. Senjutsu? Already? Naruto hadn't even been a summoner for more than an hour? Hell, he hadn't even summoned a toad yet. Of course, Naruto had been a summoner for ten years, and he was already a sage, but Jiraiya didn't need to know that. This was just a way to explain how he went into sage mode in the near future. I hate lying to Erojiji, but he can't know the truth, not yet. Naruto thought bitterly, hating the fact that he was deceiving the closest thing he had to a grandfather. All this cloak and dagger business was for their own safety. No kid. Jiraiya snapped out of his stupor, running a hand through his spiky hair. Minato never became a sage. He was going to, but... The man faltered slightly. He ran out of time. Naruto kicked at the grass beneath his feet, keeping his head down. If he looked up, he would see the grief on Jiraiya's face, and he couldn't bear to see such a downtrodden expression. But... Jiraiya continued in a softer tone, placing a hand on Naruto's head, causing the boy to look up. I'm sure that if he had lived, then he would have wanted nothing more than to see his son become a sage. A sly smirk overtook the man's face. Just like his godfather. Not just a sage. Naruto grinned cheekily. An arrow sent in. Jiraiya scowled without much ire. It was true after all. Perhaps he could corrupt Naruto as well. Yes. Naruto could become his prodigy and excel in the art of seduction where Minato could not. Unfortunately, both father and son, regardless of how powerful they were, were incapable of forming a coherent sentence when faced with talking with the object of their infatuation. Of course, Minato had gotten over it in time. Otherwise, Naruto would never have been born. Okay, brat. The perverted hermit clapped his hands together in excitement. You still haven't summoned a toad yet. We won't stop until I tell you to, or you summon the toad, Chief Gamabanta. Naruto inwardly crowed with excitement. It would be great to see old Bunta again. Y-O-S-H. He roared. Let's do this. Nicking his thumb with a kunai again, Naruto made the appropriate hand seals once more and slammed his palm against the ground shouting, Kuchios no Jetsu. Immediately, the training ground was covered with smoke. A couple jonins from the next field stopped training to see what was going on. When they saw it was Uzumaki and Jiraiya-sama, they abandoned the pretense of training to watch what would emerge from the smoke. They were highly disappointed to see two small toads, one that looked distinctly male, and the other which was female. The male toad, who had tufts of white hair, wore a dark gray cloak and a large smirk on his face. The female, clad in a pitch black cloak, had the oddest violet hair, which looked a shade brighter than Yuzuki Yugao's. Only you would summon the Naide Zingama. They heard Jiraiya-sama say in exasperation as he shook his head. It has been a while, Fukusaku-sama, Shima-sama. The Jonans looked at each other. Naide Zengama? The great toad sages? Those two little guys were that high up? Shrugging, they chalked it up to Uzumaki being Uzumaki and defying the norm no matter what he did. Naruto sighed, taking in the smug expressions on the two toads' faces. Fukusaku looked at Jiraiya, fondness and grief creeping onto his face. His wife had already attached herself to the man, much to Jiraiya's bemusement. Had it really been six years since he had carved those symbols onto his back? Those scars had been erased over time, but the scabbing from Jiraiya's chakra was still there. This feels like a dream. Fukasaku murmured just so Naruto could hear him as he hopped onto the boy's shoulder. Naruto just nodded, but the toad could see that he was controlling his emotions. 
Oi, Arojiji. Do you still want me to summon the chief? Naruto shouted with a smirk. Jiraiya responded with a glare. I think you've done enough for today. Are you jealous, Jiraiya-chan? Shima poked him. The hermit squirmed, but said nothing. In all honesty, he hadn't expected Naruto to summon them. Tadpoles? Gamabunta's kids? Yes. But these two? Absolutely not. Heck, he hadn't even been aware that they allowed themselves to be summoned in non-war times. What Jiraiya didn't know was that Naruto had indeed summoned tadpoles and Gamabunta's children before summoning Gamabunta himself, right after he had thrown the boy into a deep fissure, forcing him to use the Kyuubi's chakra in order to survive. So now what? Naruto looked rather bored as he powered a small wind jutsu that sent ripples through the water nearby. His godfather watched the casual display of controlled power with interest. He had been told that Naruto was a budding seal master, as well as proficient in elemental jutsus, but so far, Naruto hadn't shown that power yet. How do you plan on beating the Hyuga boy? By crippling him with logic. Naruto replied immediately. He slipped into Lee's Doken stance and started doing basic katas. His taijutsu was good, but he wanted it to be even better. I, I don't understand. Jiraiya frowned at the metaphorical statement. Without pausing, Naruto continued. Hyuga Niji will be a great shinobi. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt. However, the one thing that holds him back at the moment is not Hayashi-san, or the fact that he is in the branch family. The teen stopped to look Jiraiya straight in the eye, a serious expression on his face. It's his pride. His pride? Jiraiya repeated slightly doubtfully. His pride. Naruto affirmed. One of my best friends, Rock Lee, is on Niji-san's team. When Lee, the dead last, the one who couldn't use chakra, beat him, his pride was damaged. From what I heard, he threw himself back into his training with a vengeance. For him, winning is more than just winning. It's a matter of honor, of integrity, of dominance, of pride. So how will you cripple him with logic, as you said? It sounds as though you will defeat him by using his greatest weakness against him. Naruto didn't respond. Instead, he smiled mysteriously. You'll see, my perverted godfather, you'll see. His smile faded, and he looked remarkably like Shikamaru when he had his serious face on. Niji-san has a good reason to act why he does. The main branch have taken advantage of the other half of the clan. Hayashi-san cannot control the clan elders and their ideologies, Hanada is considered too weak to take over the clan, and her sister, Hanabi, has adopted the classic I have a stick up my butt attitude that many of the other Hugas have. Jiraiya couldn't help but snort at that. However, he wondered how Naruto knew the inner workings of the most secretive clan in Kanoha. When I become Hokage, things are going to change, Arojiji. Right here, right now, I am going to promise Yuga Niji that things will change. I'll get rid of the caged bird seal, and together, with the help of the future clan head, I'll change the Hyuga. The confidence, the unwavering gaze, the sheer resolve that Naruto had, it made Jiraiya want to believe him. For some reason, Jiraiya knew that Naruto's words would come to fruition. So he smiled a real smile and ruffled Naruto's hair. I'll be waiting for that day, kiddo. Sasuke had thought long and hard about what Naruto had said to him. The so-called dead last had disabled him in seconds, and Sasuke, regardless of the fact that he hadn't activated his Sharingan, had not even seen it coming. He had heard the villagers whispering about Naruto, Lee, and Shikamaru's exploits for the past couple of days. Apparently, sealing that monster was not normal, and he was going to have to fight that monster for the finals. Kakashi had told him that he was going to be training with him. You're a genius, Sasuke. But are you strong? That's what Naruto had asked him. He closed his fingers into a fist, watching as his knuckles whitened. Was he strong? In the eyes of most, he was infallible. But in Naruto's eyes, 
He had seen the emotion in his teammates' eyes. There was pity. There was understanding. There was anger. Three contradictory emotions had been present in the dobe's eyes. Naruto had wore his thoughts on a sleeve. But now, Sasuke wasn't sure if he even knew which Naruto was the real one. Was he the blithering fool that he portrayed himself to be? Or was he the calm and shrewd shinobi who had been strong enough to survive whatever it was that he had sealed? Or was he both? Personally, Sasuke thought it was the latter. If Naruto was strong, what did that make Sasuke? Weak? No. He wasn't weak. But, was he strong? The Uchiha stared out the window, scowling at the bright sun overhead. It was almost mocking him. Nisan, have I become stronger? What? Shikamaru placed his head in his hands as he listened to Naruto. Him, Lee, Gara, and Naruto were soaking in the warmth of the sun as they gazed at the clouds above. The Hokage had just finished telling them what he had heard from the toads when a sudden idea had popped into his mind. Naturally, he couldn't keep it to himself, and therefore, in typical Naruto fashion, he had shouted his idea for the world to hear. I'm going to adopt Sai. Naruto repeated merrily, oblivious to the incredulous faces of his comrades. You're going to adopt a kid the same age as you? Gara sighed, used to these outbursts. He willed his sand to whack Naruto in the back of the head, which in turn caused Naruto to send a gust of wind right back at his fellow Kage. Size younger by one month and fifteen days. Naruto pouted, wondering why they couldn't see the absolute genius behind this plan. I think it's a great idea. Lee exclaimed, earning him a grin from Naruto. We haven't even seen Sai yet. Shikamaru grimaced. He's still under Danzo's thumb. Naruto growled, remembering the one-eyed man who had been the active Rokudame while Tsunade had been out of commission. In a way, he truly appreciated that Sasuke had killed the man. If he hadn't, there was a very real possibility that a civil war would have broken out. Root. Lee sighed. They are still active. Fu, Toryun, they're good people. They've just been twisted by Danzo's extremist ideals. Shikamaru sighed. Could you develop a seal to counter the effects of Danzo's secrecy seal? Gara asked Naruto curiously. The blonde teen exhaled loudly. I could, but it would mean studying it for a long time, which would mean staring at a root member's tongue which is creepy. Hence why you want to adopt Sai. The Kazekage finished. No. Naruto yelled before taking a deep breath. No. He watched as the clouds were gently pushed by the wind, creating patterns in the sky. Sai, Sai deserves a family. Both of us are orphans, and he lost the closest thing he had to a brother very early on. He doesn't understand the world because of Danzo. He's emotionally repressed, probably even physically abused by Root, even if he doesn't see it that way. And he's been brainwashed by Danzo. When that man died, it was like Sai was free. He smiled a real smile, not the fake ones that he gave to everyone else. I want him to have a chance for a normal life, before war. I want him to have a last name, because he deserves it. Ruto. Gara and Lee exchanged looks. They knew what it felt like to be alone in this world before someone reached out a hand to them. In Gara's case, it was Naruto. And in Lee's, it was Guy. If Naruto had already made his mind up, then there was no stopping him. All they could do was support him. If you're going to adopt Sai, why not every emotionally challenged operative in Root as well? Even better, why not the remaining Jinchuriki too? Shikamaru muttered, knowing that Naruto was going to go through with this crazy idea that didn't sound so crazy the more and more he thought about it. Why didn't I think about that? You're a genius, Shika. Troublesome. The Nara pinched the bridge of his nose. If Naruto was going to be responsible for their reintegration into society, then the entire village was going to be treated to ramen-loving, orange-wearing, hyperactive, and powerful shinobi. 
may Kami have mercy upon their already burdened souls. By principle, I.W.A. Shinobi hated Kanoha. Hated was too weak of a work. Despised. Loathed. Detested. Didn't mind if they all died. Those were better. So when the Tsuchikage was handed a picture of a twelve-year child who bore a striking resemblance to one Namakaze Minato, who, though dead, was a name that was taboo to even whisper, he naturally had to delve into this child's background. Uzumaki Naruto His last name was a bit of a surprise. He hadn't heard of that clan for quite some time. He was aware that they had fled, presumably to Kiri or Aim, after the Second World War. He was, of course, aware of Uzumaki Kushina, a Kanoa Kunoichi who had been known as the Red Hot-Blooded Habanero, often shortened to the Bloody Habanero, who left a trail of carnage wherever she went. It was entirely plausible that this child was her son, as well as the son of Namake's Minato. The resemblance was too close to even consider the possibility that they weren't related. He looked at the other two pictures besides the Uzumakis. Nara Shikamaru and Rock Lee. Rumors that three Kanoha Jinin had sealed the Achibi back into its jailer had reached IWA, though that such a kid knew that it was the Uzumaki who had done the sealing, given the fact that he was an Uzumaki, and that clan had been renowned for their sealing, as had the boy's father. He read the reports that his spies had given him about these three children. After much pondering, he knew how he could have his revenge on the Kuroi Senko. His fingers landed on another scroll that was sent to him by a man that hated Kanoha almost as much as he did, and held a rather intriguing proposal within it. Perhaps he would take him up on the offer. A malevolent chuckle escaped him as he called to his jonans. Contact those in charge of updating the bingo book. He handed them the pictures of the three jinans. Listen carefully, and relay my exact words. Taking a deep breath, he leaned forward, his round face lighting up in anticipation. Let's start with a boy named Uzumaki Naruto, shall we? Kanoha, present time, unknown location. Who the hell are you? A rough voice hissed, pushing one of the three teenagers in his grasp backwards. It was too dim in the room he had shunshined to, to see which one it was. We are who we are. One of the boys sighed deeply. And no matter what else has changed, that part won't. The teenager's captive growled, half in frustration and half in anger. Betrayal welled deep within him as his lone eye adjusted to the darkness of the room. He resisted the urge to stiffen in surprise when he realized he had transported the four of them to his sensei's old apartment. Don't give me that drivel. Kakashi stalked forward, pausing to take in the appearance of Kanoha's three Injimas, who were covered in blood and bruises, expressions of guilt on their faces. His arm reached for Naruto, who was closest to him, only to be cut off by Lee and Shikamaru. For a moment, student and teacher stared at each other, countless emotions running through both of their faces. It was only when Naruto bowed his head to his second sensei did the other two drop their defensive stances. Forgive me was all the blonde boy said. Why? Kakashi pressed, not quite sure what to make of that statement. Why do you need to be forgiven, damn it? He drew in a shuddering breath. Who, who are you? Namikaze Naruto, Nara Shikamaru, Rock Lee. Shikamaru winced at the pain in his leg. Like Lee said, we are who we are. What you did today... What you've done in the preliminaries, that coupled with the knowledge you shouldn't have. Kakashi trailed off. Everyone in the room could feel the remainders of his chakra gathering. Clearly, your identities are a lie. They're not. Naruto let out a breath and slumped against the wall. His fists clenched at his side, nails digging deeper into his palms in order to stop the scream that threatened to burst from his mouth. They're not. He said again, his voice no louder than a whisper. Then tell me. Kakashi crossed his hands over his chest and stared at them flatly. We knew about the invasion beforehand. Lee's eyes met Kakashi's. Surprise was not the emotion that was reflected back at him. I gathered as much. 
The older man sneered. But even we couldn't have anticipated what happened today. Shikamaru ran a hand over his cheek in frustration. And why not? Kakashi pressed, already fingering the kunai in his back pocket. Because that's not what happened last time. Naruto pushed himself off of the wall. Come again? I said, that's not what happened last time. Naruto repeated, gazing evenly back at his sensei. What, what are you saying? Kakashi ran his student's words in his mind a couple of times, trying to make sense of them. It means what it means, sensei. Naruto frowned. Aren't you this village's elite? Figure it out. As soon as the words left his mouth, he found himself pinned against the wall, kunai resting at his jugular. And Kakashi found himself bound by a shadow, with Lee's own kunai aimed at his spinal cord. Attack our Hokage, and we'll kill you. Shikamaru snarled. Try it. Lee pressed the kunai farther into Kakashi's back, just enough to make contact with skin. I dare you. But Kakashi didn't move. Partially because he was physically incapable of doing so. His long eye stared into the weary, fatigued ones of Naruto's, and he was struck by the acceptance and understanding within eyes that should be young and carefree. In your mind, you already know, don't you, Sensei? A dry chuckle escaped Naruto. The teen snapped his fingers, and in the next moment, Kakashi found himself free to move about. He stumbled back slightly, I flitting from boy to boy, gauging them. Know what? Kakashi asked cautiously. You know what I'm talking about. There was pained amusement in Naruto's voice. Who are you? Kakashi dropped his kunai to the floor and let the events of the day weigh him down. I'm just Naruto. He tried to smile, but it came out as more of a grimace. I became Rokudame Hokage when I was 19 years old. This is Shikamaru, Captain of Tactical Operations. That's Lee, Captain of the Joint Shinobi Alliance Ground Forces. Naruto reached up and patted his sensei on the shoulder. And the three of us are from the future. Kanoha, six hours ago. I don't like the feeling I'm getting right now. Something isn't right. Naruto grimaced. You sure it wasn't all the food you ate last night? Lee grinned before sobering quickly. This wasn't the time to be joking. The two teens walked out of their room, only to be met by a grim-faced Shikamaru and an equally stoic Shikaku. For a moment, the four of them stood in silence before Shikaku began to speak. No matter what happens today, just know that I'll be backing you 100% of the way. Thank you, sir. Naruto bowed his head to the older man. You have no idea how much that means to us. Shikaku stared and each of them before speaking once more. I know that you would like to change the future that you came from, but just remember, nothing is set in stone. The future has already been changed from you arriving here, however some events may stay the same. The trio glanced at each other. We know. Shikamaru sighed. We know, and that's the worst part. We know exactly what happened during our Chunin exams, and we know how this one day affected us for the rest of our lives. The Chunin exams, Lee grimaced, are nothing more than an excuse for opposing villages to fight one another. They are the more peaceful alternative to war. However, his voice hardened. In our timeline, the foundations for a true war begin due to this day. Do you think that will change? Shikaku questioned shrewdly. No. Shikamaru answered his father after a tense silence. He looked at Naruto, whose hands were balled into fists. We will simply be more prepared. The Sandame is aware of that something rather unwelcoming is going to happen today. He has increased the number of ANBU patrolling the area. While hi san was not able to hear all of the plan, he relayed the information that he had to the Hokage. Shikaku frowned slightly. According to him, he was teleported to the Jounin Lounge when it seemed one of the two men who were talking sensed him. The older man's face was hard, but his eyes were soft. Naruto had the decency to blush. 
Ah, uh, yes. That was me. Like we told you, last time Hyate Senpai was killed by Baki-san. This time, since I told Baki-san to proceed as he would have if we hadn't changed Gara's mind about the invasion, Orochimaru must have sensed him. Luckily, I got him out in time. Don't get too cocky. Shikaku warned. Yes, Suna is now on our side, and yes, we have the advantage of knowing what will happen, however who knows what the ripples of your actions are. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The three time travelers look to one another before they straighten with determination. Whatever happens today will set the stage for tomorrow. Naruto said slowly. He looked weary. We will be on edge, preparing for the very worst that could happen. As Shikaku opened his mouth to speak, Yoshino pranced into the hallway with a glint in her eye that didn't bode well for anyone. Breakfast has been on the table for ten minutes. Her voice lowered dangerously. Two of you will be fighting in the finals. What would happen if you collapsed from not eating properly? And you? She rounded on her husband, who cowered back slightly. What kind of an example are you setting for them? Shikaku scratched his head slightly, knowing it was a rhetorical question. If you're not there within thirty seconds. She raised the spatula in her hand. Then you know what will happen. Needless to say, the four men quickly took their place at the table and diligently ate the food that the Nara matriarch had prepared. Hokage-sama An ANBU with an owl mask knelt in front of his leader. Report We have amped up security surrounding our borders as well as for the stadium itself. The four boundaries are manned by teams Delta, Epsilon, Gamma, and Beta. The ANBU murmured. What of Team Ro? The Hokage asked. Tenzo Taishu as well as Yuzuki Fukutechu have positioned their team just outside the village as a first line of defense. They will also be tasked with seeing the Mizukich and Kazekage into the village. Saratobi eyed the ANBU in front of him and motioned for him to rise. Hataki Kakashi, though no longer your ANBU commander, will be your first point of contact. He will sound the internal alarm should anything go wrong. Understood? Hi. Very well. Dismissed. The operative left in a blur, leaving the Hokage alone to his thoughts. The information that Hei 8 had given them meant that something was going to happen today. Unfortunately and fortunately, no one could be sure of exactly what was going to happen because the sickly Jounin was forcibly sunshined away before he could hear the rest of the plan and subsequently be killed for it. Whoever had done the deed had not come forward. It was as if they wanted to remain anonymous. While the Hokage was grateful that one of his shinobi had not died, he didn't like the idea of an unknown person of unknown capabilities running loose in the village. They could prove to be a future threat. A knock on his door swept his thoughts away. Enter. Nara Shikaku walked into his office, a grave look on his face. It had been this man who had notified the Hokage that whatever it was Hei-8 had seen or heard should not be taken lightly. And while the Hokage had no intention of dismissing the sickly Jounin's observations, he hadn't been ready to take them as seriously as he was right now. Are all preparations set? The commander asked without preamble. The Hokage raised an eyebrow. That question should have come out of his mouth, not the Naras. Nonetheless, he nodded. They are. Good. Shikaku's shoulders slumped like a great burden had been lifted off of them. Saratobi puffed on his pipe and keenly observed the man in front of him. Ever since Naruto and Lee had entered his life, Shikaku had changed. He seemed more carefree, less guarded, and more determined. Are they ready? Shikamaru and Naruto? Shikaku scratched his head. In truth, I have no idea. They told me not to worry about it, that they had plans. What those plans are, I have not yet been able to deduce. Oh ho! The Hokage was certainly looking forward to today's fights. They would provide more information on the skills that Shikamaru and Naruto had hidden. 
Lee had certainly proved himself against Gara, but he had forfeited for obvious reasons. Still, it was a shame. That boy's taijutsu was nearly unrivaled. Is Jiraiya-sama here? Shikaku questioned suddenly. No, he left three days ago. His spy network needs him to be there continuously, and apparently new information about a particular threat came in. Saratobi at Shikaku. The Nara head looked annoyed. He did tell me that Naruto's training had flourished and placed a very large bet on the boy, as well as one on Shikamaru. He has put me under strict instructions to relay every last detail of Naruto's match to him. That brought a small smile to his face. He imagined that Naruto wasn't so much worried about what training he could get. The boy probably wanted to be as close to his godfather as possible. However, with Jiraiya out of the village, a major resource had also vanished along with him. Then again, they had three very strong time travelers. The Kazekage and Mizukage will be arriving shortly, no? Shikaku stroked his chin. Can we be certain to trust both of them? Through the boys, he knew that the Kazekage was Orochimaru in disguise, and that Terumi Mei was a cousin of Naruto. Still, he would like to hear the Sandame's input. Suna and Kanoha are on shaky terms at best. Sarutobi sighed. It's not a matter of trust, it's a matter of keeping up appearances. As for the Mizukage, Kiri is still rebuilding after the Agura regime. While they are weak, I have confidence in Terumi-san. As for trusting her, she is Naruto's relative. If Naruto takes to her, then I will as well. I'm sure those two will be like two peas in a pod. Shikaku said wryly. Naruto was like a little parasite that wormed himself into your very being, took root there, and spread. His energy, smile, and personality were infectious. If that's all you came to ask Shikaku, I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. I have important business that I must attend to the old man stood up. For a minute, Shikaku opened his mouth, but then closed it and shook his head. There is nothing else, Hokage-sama. Enjoy the rest of your morning. He left with a puff of smoke, leaving the Hokage alone and with his own thoughts. What is it that has Shikaku so on edge? The stadium was packed to the brim. Every man, woman, and child in the arena were expectantly awaiting the matches that pitted genius against genius, village against village, comrade against comrade. This will be fun. Terumi made lazily crossed a leg and leaned back in her seat next to the Hokage. Behind her stood Chujuro and Ao. The swordsman kept glancing left and right as if expecting someone to leap out at him and attack them. Ao looked to be bored out of his mind. May had been suitably impressed. Kiri needed to build something like this for future Chunin exams as well. From the little she had seen of Kanoha, it had seemed to be a lively place. It had recovered well from the QB attack all those years ago. She only hoped that her own village could recuperate like this one had. Excited to see Naruto Kuen compete? The Hokage teased. To his other side, the Kazekage twitched slightly. He is an Uzumaki. May replied indifferently. It has been some time since I met another of my clan. She ignored the snorts from Ao and Chujuro and the knowing gaze of the Hokage. So what if she was excited to see the blonde kid? That was only expected. She had even traveled all the way here to see him. Underneath his hat, the Kazekage, Orochimaru's lips thinned. He had not known that the Mizukage would be arriving. She had no need to as none of her genin had made it to the finals. But because of that Namake's brat, it was of no matter. He would proceed as planned. There were only three Kiri Shinobi present anyway. Besides, it didn't matter if the Mizukage was here or not. Orochimaru smirked. Having IWA agree to join him was wholly unexpected, but welcome as well. With the three of them, Odo, IWA, and Suna united as one against Kanoha, nothing, no one would stand in his way like they had last time. Unfortunately, IWA would have to bear the brunt of the blame should anything go wrong. 
it would be very amusing to see the two villages destroy each other just like last time. Kanoho would not be able to withstand the attack, and no one would oppose him. Not Saratobi, not Jiraiya, and certainly not the Namakes. Both Minato and Naruto. Speaking of the brat. He had just walked into where the Kanoha Jinnin were all gathered, regardless of whether they had passed the preliminaries or not. The Nara and Green Kids were next to him. For a split second, the child raised his head and looked up to where the Kagias were sitting. He stared straight at the Kazakage for an agonizing moment. And then the child smiled. He had the audacity to smile. For a moment, Orochimaru wondered if it would be all right to kill the kid right then and there. He kept his bloodlust to himself, though. Because he was going to have fun breaking little Naruto. He was going to destroy the kid in the way he couldn't destroy his father or godfather. Uzumaki Naruto was going to burn for the frustration he had caused the Sanin. And with that thought in mind, Orochimaru smiled back. One kilometer from Kanoha's border. The IWA Shinobi led by the Tsuchikage himself slowly but surely gained ground towards Kanoha. All of them were disguised as merchants, and because of this, they had to travel at a civilian's rate once they had entered fire country. It was tiresome and tedious, but they had managed. Halt! An androgynous voice suddenly stopped all of them in their tracks. From nowhere, an ANBU dropped to the ground, stopping directly in front of Anoki. Identification. The ANBU held out his her hand. The Tsuchikage, in his disguise as head merchant, quickly dropped the completely legitimate papers into the outstretched hand. They had overtaken a caravan of traders who were selling clothing. It was the perfect cover. Many of them, nearly 100, were able to pose as merchants. This way, they would be right in the heart of Kanoha when Orochimaru gave the order to attack. The look on that old monkey's face when he realized what was going on would be perfect. The ANBU, done confirming the papers, searched the merchandise. Once the two was deemed as having passed, he, she personally escorted them into the village. Upon seeing the Yandame's face carved into the mountain, Anoki's resolve hardened. Today, Kanoha would fall. Naruto couldn't deny that he was nervous. It was inevitable after all. He had a plan on how to deal with Niji, a plan that he had not discussed with anybody save Kurama. The plan was rather foolhardy and gutsy. In other words, it was something only Uzumaki Naruto could pull off. Stop it. Kurama grumbled in his stomach. You're making me want to hurt you. Naruto scowled slightly but brushed off the fox's whining. He had dealt with far greater threats in the past, after all. Do you mind slapping him? Shikamaru asked Lee, who grunted with amusement. Naruto Kuen, Lee shook the blonde shoulder, earning himself a glare from the team. You're making everyone nervous. Lee pointed to the other Jinin and Jounin senseis in the box who were looking at him uneasily. With a sigh, Naruto tuned down the killing intent he hadn't known he was giving off. It was a defense mechanism he had picked off. If you're scared, then make your opponent feel scared as well. He's really on edge, isn't he? Shikamaru couldn't deny that he felt the same way though. The future depended on today. We have a right to be. Lee agreed grimly. The trio descended into their own thoughts, leaving the world behind for a moment. Kiba stared at his fellow Jinin thoughtfully. Do you ever think those three don't realize that we're right here? Karinai glanced at her feral student and nodded. It's like they're in their own world. Right. Naruto yelled suddenly, startling many people around him. He pointed to Shikamaru and Lee with fire in his eyes. I'm going to ruffle lots of feathers today, so I need to know that you have my back. The two others simply gave him a blank look. Is that even a question? Lee put his hands on his hips, anger in his eyes. After everything, you don't think that we have your back? That's not what I meant. Naruto shook his head frantically. He looked as though he had just committed the most heinous crime on earth. He lowered his head. It's just that. 
Don't ask a question you know the answer to. Shikamaru yawned lazily. Beat Niji with whatever means necessary. If you lose, I will kill you myself. Ha ha. Naruto laughed nervously. Thanks, guys. Anytime, Naruto Kuen. Lee laughed jovially. He turned back to the watch the arena. I too will beat you within an inch of your life if you do not defeat Niji. And then the three of them burst into a series of snorts and chuckles that no one understood. Behind them, everyone else turned to Hugo Niji, who was eyeing the blonde with murder written in his eyes. It seemed as though the trio had truly forgotten he was there. Before the Hyuga acted any further, the Hokage walked down to the middle of the arena. A hush fell over the gathered. The exam was about to begin. I would like to thank all of for coming here. The Hokage began, making sure to look at all four corners of the crowd. I would especially like to welcome the Mizukich and Kazakage into our humble village. I hope they are pleased with what they have seen so far. Saratobi put his hands together in clapping for the two Kages, and the rest of the crowd followed in politely. Regardless of whether you have come from an exotic land or from the comfort of your homes right here in Kanoha, I hope that this exam entertains you. The Hokage smiled. Without further ado, I would like to formally announce the beginning of the Chunin exams. The crowd roared with anticipation. From somewhere, a gong reverberated through the arena, sending shockwaves everywhere. Saratobi nodded to the proctor, Genma who took the senbon out of his mouth. First match, Hyuga Niji of Kanoha vs. Uzumaki Naruto of Kanoha. Competitors, meet me in the arena. Naruto took a deep breath and steeled his resolve. He chanced to look behind him before looking forward quickly. Niji was mad. Couple that with the last time he had seen the man, he had died in his arms, it made for a very antsy Naruto. Good luck, Hokage-sama. Shikamaru murmured in his ear. His best friend gave him a reassuring pat on the back. You'll do great, naruto Kuen. Lee bounced on his toes. Kick his ass, Naruto. Kiba screamed. Do us proud, Naruto. Sakura smiled slightly. Good luck, Naruto Kuen. Hinata whispered shyly. Since her injuries had not been as severe as they were last time, she was able to come to the finals. Niji brushed past him and gracefully made his way downward. Naruto just shook his head before grinning madly. How about I make an entrance? He asked the other two. Go for it. Shikamaru shook his head. Naruto winked slyly before gathering his chakra and vanishing. And reappearing in a bolt of lightning right next to Genma who jumped back a good ten feet in surprise. Uzumaki Naruto has arrived. He cried out, flashing a blinding smile at the Hokage box. The crowd's volume increased. So that's Uzumaki Naruto, huh? Turumi made suddenly smiled. Blonde, loud, and powerful. Interesting. She liked his style already. He knew how to make an entrance. He's something. Ao said fondly, recalling the time he had spent with the blonde. Definitely an Uzumaki. Chujuro confirmed uneasily. Hopefully, that kid didn't visit Kiri too much. Their village might not survive. Genma just shook his head as he walked back over to the grinning kid and his irate opponent. The two fighters took their places opposite each other. Niji dropped into the jiken stance while Naruto slouched lazily. Watch carefully, Hanabi. Hyuga Hayashi told his youngest daughter. No one in the Hyuga clan has inherited the Kekiai Genkai as strongly as Niji has. The patriarch stared at Naruto with a glare. He knew what the blonde had done in the preliminaries, but could not bring himself to respect the boy. That child was a mockery of what the Yandame had sacrificed. Somewhere within the crowd, the disguised Suchikich carefully took in the figure of his loathed enemy's only child. The boy seemed to be an Uzumaki in personality and Namikaze in looks. His lips curled into disgust. Just how powerful was this boy? Genma didn't bother trying to tell Uzumaki to take this seriously. 
Instead, he looked at each boy. Begin. As soon as Genma leaped back, Niji struck. He moved forward with speed that many Chunin couldn't rival. Aiming for Naruto's Tenketsu, he moved his hand down for the first strike, only for Naruto to blur out of sight. Naruto, who saw the first coming, jumped out of the way and reappeared right behind Niji. With a single kick to the back of Niji's neck, he dropped to the ground and watched the prodigy stumble. Too slow Niji. Any mirth that Naruto had once held was gone. He slipped to a defensive stance when he saw Niji charging his way once again. Easily, Naruto dodged the next attack as well, this time elbowing the Hyuga in the collarbone. You're going to have to use your Byakugan if you want to win. Naruto crossed his arms over his chest, sounding very much like a sensei. Scowling, Niji knew that the blonde was right. He had disregarded the kid as nothing but a loud talker, but the blonde had shown skill in evading his attacks. In hindsight, Niji also should have taken account what had happened in the forest of death. Uzumaki was more powerful than Niji had thought. Byakugan. He cried out. Much better. Naruto smirked. Now the match can truly begin. Who will win Niji? Fate? Or the kid that defied the fate he had been given since birth? The Hyuga snarled and charged forward, intending to strike at this insolent child's heart and end the match decisively. Except that Naruto dodged. He dodged the next attack. And the attack after that. And the one after that. Fight damn it. Niji screamed in frustration. He knew his uncle wasn't going to like him losing his composure, but there was no helping it. Stop running away like a coward. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Coward? Me? Well, this isn't the first time I've been accused of being something I'm not. He shrugged, rolling his neck as he did so. All right. I'll fight. As he said those words, a crushing chakra filled the arena. Naruto looked as calm as ever as he stared stoically in front of him. The sky seemed to darken as the chakra spread outward. Those in the genin box save for a few shrunk backwards. Sakura and Ino collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath. W.H. What is that? Sakura tried to scream. Naruto's chakra. Shikamaru didn't look phased by the mass outpouring of energy at all. He's getting serious. A bit too serious. Was this a warning to Orochimaru as well? Are we late? Gara's voice made Shikamaru tense slightly before he relaxed and shook the future Kazakage's hand. Nope. Lee beamed. Naruto Kuen is just warming Niji up. Naruto's chakra is as comforting as ever. Gara smirked to himself, enjoying the wary looks he was getting from everyone. This was amusing. He looked to his siblings, who were leaning on the railing, sweat pouring down their faces, just struggling to remain upright. Save for the jonin, everyone else seemed to be in the same state. What do you have planned, Naruto? The chakra was making it difficult for Niji to stand. He gritted his teeth and told himself to hang on just for a bit more. And just as suddenly as it had arrived, the oppressive chakra vanished. What was that? Niji spat, inwardly trying to regain composure. A psychological tactic? Naruto shrugged lazily. Think of it what you will. I just thought it was cathartic. You know, a good way to release my frustrations. He looked at Niji with a cocked head. You need some catharsis as well, I think. I believe beating you will be the best catharsis I can have. Niji growled. Snorting, Naruto created two Kage Bunshin in order to throw the Hyuga off track. The Kage Bunshin was a perfect copy of the original. In most cases, it was impossible to tell which one was real and which one wasn't. All three of them attacked at the same time. To many, it seemed as though Naruto had attacked the Hyuga sloppily and randomly. He and his clones were hit on multiple occasions, and they took much damage. Still, Naruto's clones did manage to get several good hits on Niji. 
After one blow, Naruto's clones vanished and he was thrown back five feet, only to land in a crumpled heap. He looked completely exhausted. Wearily, Naruto stood up slowly, a grin on his face. Not bad. The teen licked the blood dripping from his mouth. But not good enough. The blonde charged again. You are in my range of divination. Niji slipped into a different form, one that elicited gasps from Hayashi and Hinata alike. That stance. Hayashi narrowed his eyes. How did he learn it? Naruto prepared himself for what was coming next. Jukenpo, hack Rokujiancho. Asterisk Niji leaped forward. Two palms. Naruto stumbled back as the attack made its mark. Four palms. Blood was coughed up. Eight palms. Naruto's legs lost sensation. Sixteen palms. Naruto collapsed to the ground, unable to move at all. Humph. Niji smirked from above him. I guess that settles the debate then. Fate will always win. What is he doing? Gara asked, a little intrigued with the turn of events. Don't ask me. Shikamaru replied. We didn't talk about how we were going to defeat our opponents. A significant look was passed between them. Because we had better things to plan for. It remained unsaid, but understood. He's done. Tintin felt bad for the kid. She had seen what he had done against Gara in the preliminaries, but it seemed as though Niji had outdone him. That doesn't make sense. Kiba yelled. Naruto was supposed to be more powerful than this. Guy, who had been watching with narrowed eyes the entire time, agreed with Kiba. Perhaps Naruto has another plan? Kakashi drawled from the side. He rested against the wall comfortably, but the book that accompanied him had been put away. Sasuke stood separate from the other genins as he observed Naruto intently. When did you arrive here, my hip rival? Guy screamed. Kakashi didn't answer. I think Naruto is getting up again. Ino pointed shakily. Let's watch. Call the match, Proctor San. Niji sniffed. It is over. Genma frowned. This wasn't the Uzumaki he knew. This was, this was weird. Nonetheless, while Naruto had attempted to get up again, the effort had been futile. The kid was done. Fine. Winner. And then Naruto vanished in a poof of smoke. Where the body had once lay, only empty ground remained. A clone. Niji looked around in confusion, as did Genma. Slow clapping was heard from where the Hokages were sitting. Excellent Niji, simply brilliant. A voice stated with amusement. You. Niji snarled in fury, pointing to Naruto, the real one, who was sitting on top of the Hokage's box enjoying a bowl of ramen. Shikamaru fought to control a sigh. He teleported into the arena, ramen and all. Yogen Ma Senpai. He raised a hand in his direction. Sorry about this. So you're not dead? Genma snorted. Fine by me. I'll continue the match. Naruto slurped the last of his ramen down and sealed the bowl. Wiping his mouth, he turned to face Niji. Sorry I'm late. The road of life took me to a Chiraku ramen. I couldn't resist. All eyes turned to Kakashi who rubbed his head sheepishly. Are you telling me that the person I was fighting was not you at all? Niji's voice was dangerously low. Of course not. Naruto beamed. Did you really think that I was that much of an idiot for attacking a Hyuga head-on? Nope. I just wanted to prove to you how you yourself defied fate. What? Eight trigrams, sixty-four palms. Naruto started. Hack Rokujiancho. It is said that that technique is passed down to only one person in the main branch. You were never supposed to know of it, let alone use it better than the current heir. The blonde chuckled. I do believe that is known as defying fate. Silence rang through the stadium. Imagine what Hizashi-san would be saying about you right now, Niji. 
Naruto's eyes softened. He wouldn't like the path that you're going on. In the audience, Hayashi leaned forward in his seat, pale eyes narrowed. What did that boy know of what his brother would have wanted? Shut up. Niji screamed, trying to attack Naruto. What do you know about my father? What do you know of what he sacrificed because of the main branch? Naruto expertly dodged the attack. He opened his palm fully before closing it into a fist. Activate. Naruto said calmly. His voice was the only one even daring to speak. Ugh. Niji found himself unable to move his body. He found that he was forced onto his knees, his arms rigidly positioned away from his body. Though he tried to move, it was impossible. He was completely at Naruto's mercy. With wide eyes, he looked at Naruto, who was watching him with sadness in his eyes. When my clone hit you in the beginning, he placed an immobilization seal on you which allowed me to render you motionless right now. Until I say so, you will not be released. Naruto sighed. Had I wanted to win this match outright, I would have used ninjutsu. But there's something I needed to do, so I decided to go the long method instead. Suddenly, Naruto's face twisted into an ugly snarl that reminded Niji of the elders. The shorter boy's hand suddenly molded itself into a hand seal that Niji was very familiar with. Dread and disbelief ran through his system. How? Activate. Naruto sneered, this time spitting out the word like it was poison. There was a split second of inaction before. Niji screamed out in pain as he felt the seal on his forehead respond to the command. It felt as thought every vein in his body was on fire. The fact that he was immobile only increased the agony. This was unlike any other time that the seal had been used upon him. It felt stronger and much more poignant. Through blurred vision, he saw Naruto's face twist into one of remorse as he released the seal. Naruto took a deep breath as he watched Niji shudder, no doubt due to the aftershocks of pain. I'm sorry, my friend. In the stands, Shikamaru and Lee exchanged looks of disbelief. Had Naruto just done what they think he did? Naruto Kuen. Hinata clasped a hand over her mouth at the measure of cruelty that her crush had displayed. How could he use the Hyuga clan's curse seal? Guy's voice lacked its normal enthusiasm. Staring at his rival's student and his own student splayed out like a martyr, an unfamiliar feeling crept into his veins. I don't know. Kakashi murmured to himself, his one visible eye wide. What is he doing? That's not the Naruto that I know. You don't think? Kurinai trailed off, her eyes narrowing at the blonde. If you believe what I think you are implying, Gar's voice was controlled and even, but everyone heard the thinly disguised anger within it, then you are a fool. He gazed at his fellow Jinchuriki impassively. Naruto is not someone who uses pain to control someone. He is about to prove a point. The boy exhaled loudly and pointed one pale finger at Naruto. Watch. As if on cue, Naruto bowed low to Niji. I'm sorry. The guilt rolled off of him in waves. H. How? Was all Niji was able to choke out. Naruto eyed the Hyuga for a moment before plopping down. On the ground. And sighed. You wanted to give me a history lesson, didn't you? The teen squinted at Niji, who was trying to feebly move against his invisible ropes. But let me give you one. It's about the Uzumaki clan. Niji stilled. See, the Uzumakis, me, we're known as experts in Fuinjetsu, the sealing arts, and because of that, the clan was almost wiped out during the Second Shinobi War. Naruto observed the boy carefully. You know about seals. It wasn't a question. Well, so do I. Naruto got up and dusted himself off. His astute eyes found Hyuga Hayashi in the crowd. A smirk blossomed on his face. I, more than anyone, know about seals. The crowd tensed. Because it's in my blood. As an Uzumaki, I love seals. Naruto pinched his brow in mock frustration. But there's a couple that I don't like. 
Slowly, Naruto stalked forward and removed Niji's headband, revealing to the whole world the Hyuga clan's cursed seal. Hinata flinched at the sight of it. Ah yes. This monstrosity. Naruto smiled unpleasantly. Did you know that all seals in Konoha are originally Uzumaki seals? It would make sense that they were. After all, the Uzumaki and Senju clans were cousins. To answer your question as to how I can activate that seal, it's because that seal's full potential can only be used by an Uzumaki. That is why you were in so much pain. Not even the birds chirped. See that Niji? He pointed to the spiral on Gunma's flak jacket. That's my clan's symbol. The fact that it's on every piece of shinobi attire signifies the kinship between the Senju and Uzumaki. Niji managed to sneer at him. So what? He felt exposed, naked almost. Fear crawled up through his spine. Was he going to activate the seal again? So what? He says. Naruto scoffed. I'm trying to help you, and you dismiss me? Naruto shook his head. How can you possible help me? My fate was decided since birth. Niji screamed. I am nothing but a servant of the main branch because my father was born as the younger twin. Naruto looked at him in exasperation. On the monitors that projected the match to everyone in the stadium, his emotions seemed amplified. The boy then walked over and slowly placed a hand on Niji's shoulder. Looking the boy in his eyes, Naruto said the words that would forever change the Hyuga clan. I'm going to remove that seal from your forehead. I'm going to remove that seal from your forehead. Naruto's declaration was met with silence. Did you know of this? Yoshino asked her husband closing her jaw which had fallen open. Shikaku shook his head, partly in disbelief, partly in amusement. Only Naruto. The gathered IWA name were on the edges of their seats. Could it be true? Was this the power of the Namikaze? So this is what he meant by ruffling a few feathers. Lee slapped a hand to his forehead. Did I just hear that right? Kakashi stared at his student. He's going to. Apparently. Shikamaru muttered with fond exasperation. Naruto had been working hard this past month, hadn't he? That's impossible. Hinata cried out. No one, no one can do that. Naruto can. Gara stated impassively. After all, he devised a seal for me, didn't he? At the reminder, eyes flitted to the future Kazakage's stomach and then back to Naruto. Niji was in a state of shock. There was no way that this, this, Brad had confidently told him that he was going to remove the cursed seal from his being. Close your mouth. Naruto muttered. Like I said, every seal is based on an Uzumaki design. The curse seal that your clan took after we were supposedly wiped out was used as a torture seal on enemy Nin. A furious Naruto sent a glare at Hayashi which could have killed the clan head in his seat. But your clan took it and twisted it into something that should never be used on family. The blonde was dripping with fury, Niji realized. But it was on his behalf. Someone was fighting to save him. Naruto drew in a great gulp of oxygen before turning to the Kage box. Therefore, as future clan head of the Uzumaki clan, and proxy for the Senju, I am, in front of my Kage, calling in the debt that the Hyuga owe the Uzumaki. The price for stealing a seal that is not their own will not cost you any money. Instead, I demand that in one week's time, every branch member of the Hyuga clan be seen by me so that the cursed seal may be removed. Should they fail to do so, I am well within my right to enact necessary measures against the Hyuga clan. Is this acceptable, Hokage-sama? Sarutobi Yeruzen stared at the boy with shock. No matter what Naruto did, he would always manage to surprise him. How had the boy known that the Hyuga seal was originally an Uzumaki seal? Only the elders, himself, and the Hyuga clan elders were aware of this. Unfortunately for the Hugas, they were outpowered by a single child. Naruto held a claim to both the Uzumaki and Senju seats. 
he outranked every shinobi in the village save for Tsunade via his lineage alone. To go against him was suicide. How ironic that the boy the village had shunned was actually someone who they should have been treating like a prince. It is Uzumaki Naruto. The Hokage said with a hint of pride. Gasps went up throughout the crowd. Hayashi looked ready to explode. Hanabi just looked at her father in confusion. The implications of what the Hokage had just allowed, all eyes turned with gut-churning anticipation back to Naruto. Nodding to himself, Naruto stared at the cursed seal for a minute before he pulled out a set of pre-made seals. I'm going to remove it now. Me using the seal against you was part of my plan. By doing so, I have warmed it up so to speak. Many people are not aware of this, but there is a refractory period in which that seal cannot be used. I did not mean to torture you. It was a necessary evil in order to help you. Naruto told Niji seriously. I made a promise that I was going to change the Hyuga clan before I became Hokage. But I couldn't wait any longer. Is that all right with you? Niji couldn't speak. How could anyone respond to that? So he nodded. Satisfied, Naruto went to work. This wasn't like a typical Uzumaki seal which dealt more with spirals and layering. This was a crude but effective measure of causing pain. Plus, the clan had tweaked it to ensure that the Byakugan was sealed after death. Naruto pulled out the seal that he had painstakingly worked on throughout the month. It was like no other that he had ever made. The unsophisticated nature of the seal actually made it relatively simple to undo. Well, simple for a master of his caliber. However, he had to make sure that he wouldn't damage Niji's Byakugan after it had been activated. The Hyuga seal was comprised of straight lines that intersected each other. To reverse this, he had to make a seal that utilized an even pattern, 2 over 4. If it worked, this seal would open Niji's, allowing Naruto to do what he did best. He steeled his resolve before slapping the piece of paper onto Niji's forehead and murmuring soft words under his breath. This will work. I know it will. All of a sudden, Niji's forehead glowed with white bright light. Naruto smirked. So it had worked. He had just opened the foundations to reverse engineer the seal. Now, the process was fairly easy. Pulling out even more seals that he had made, he pressed more of them down to Niji's forehead. These were to ensure that when the seal was removed from him, his chakra pathways would still function normally. Stepping back, Naruto admired his handiwork. He truly was a genius. Now, there was only one thing to do. Grinning cheekily up at Hayashi who looked like death would be too good a punishment for Naruto, Naruto said only one word. Release. Niji screamed. The pain he was in was something that he had never experienced before. It was greater than when Naruto had used the cursed seal on him just a few minutes ago. However, just as soon the pain had arrived, it was gone. He blinked. His vision was slightly blurry. Another blink later, and it was clear, revealing the smiling face of a blonde kid who he had dismissed so easily not too long ago. Niji was acutely aware that the stadium was silent. Slowly, learning that he could move again, he stood up. Naruto transformed a kunai into a mirror and held it up to Niji's face. Instead of the cursed seal on his forehead, only smooth flesh remained. The Hyuga found that he couldn't breathe. Collapsing to his knees the ground in sheer joy, he couldn't help the tears that ran down his face. The seal was gone. Gone. There wasn't a trace of it left. For the first time in his life, all Niji could see was the unmarred skin of his forehead. Uzumaki Naruto had done the impossible. The blonde outstretched an arm and helped Niji to his feet, a clinical look on his face. Activate your Byakugan. Niji did as he was told. For some reason, his vision just felt clearer. Naruto let out the breath he didn't know he had been holding. Good. Everything had gone right. Chakra exhaustion? Negative. Blurred vision? Negative. Headache? Negative. 
A sense of freedom? Niji took in a quivering breath and nodded. Hi. Naruto smiled from ear to ear. So, are we going to continue? Niji let out a laugh. After all that, he wanted to continue. How could he possibly fight this person? I forfeit. Niji yelled out to the still silent crowd. And then bowed to Naruto, who suddenly had a particular glint in his eye. Rise, Hugo Niji. Niji did as he was told. Looking into determined cerulean eyes, he was pulled into a firm handshake. Let today mark the new beginning of a friendship between the Uzumaki and Hyuga clans. Naruto declared. Naruto looked at Genma, whose senbon had fallen from his mouth. So, can we go? Genma shook himself out of his stupor and promptly bopped Naruto on the head. What was that for? Naruto mumbled, massaging his sore head. That was for telling me that you weren't a seal master. The Jounin yelled. Fine, fine, I'm sorry I lied. Now please call the match or else you'll have a pissed off master on your hands. Genma actually took the threat seriously. Winner, Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto just grinned, took hold of Niji's kimono, and teleported the both of them to where the other genin were. At their looks, Naruto just shrugged. Did you expect anything less of me? What just happened? Mei asked the Hokage, her eyes were wide and her mind had not processed what she had just seen. Don't tell me that my cousin just dash. He just changed the entire structure of one of the most powerful clans in Kanoha because he could. Sarutobi sighed. This was going to be, in the words of the Nara clan, troublesome. They'll want his head on a platter. Ao commented, rubbing the Byakugan eye behind his eye patch. They can't have it. Sarutobi smiled. Because they did steal an Uzumaki seal without permission. I don't know how he got that information. They have to comply with his request, or else Naruto will take control of their clan. Does this happen often with him? May inquired weakly. At the preliminaries, he sealed the tailed beast back within its container. Sarutobi pointed at Gara. He's doing fine now. May looked rather pale. Orochimaru tensed. He knew of the resealing of the beast. It was not ideal, but he was fairly sure that Gara was still going to carry out the plan. Baki hadn't told him otherwise. Seal masters were valued all over the globe because of how much of an asset they were. If he could have Naruto, what power he would have within his fingertips. His patience was waning thin. Now would be the perfect time to attack. Orochimaru discreetly activated a chakra flare that was sent to every IWA, Odo, and Sunanin. In five minutes, Kanoha would descend into chaos. Naruto was tackled by a violet blur. Thank you. Hinata sobbed into his chest. One of her hands had latched into Niji's clothing and pulled him close. The boy looked so surprised, Naruto couldn't help but snicker. He gently pried Hinata from his chest and patted her on the head all while ignoring the looks his friends were giving him. Guiding the crying girl to the frozen Niji, he watched as she attacked Niji with a hug as well. Nisan. She clutched him closer. Niji looked at Naruto, who just shook his head and mimed a hug. Gulping, Niji did as he was told. It was different. So, Kakashi circled Naruto slowly. Any other surprises you want to pull? Not really. Naruto shook his head. I think I'm done. Wait till they learn about Karama. Shut up. They'll love you. The fox snorted. I said shut up. Uzumaki-sama. Niji turned to the blonde and suddenly got down on one knee. Naruto stared wide-eyed. Huh? I cannot repay you for what you've done. You have, you have. The Hyuga looked up. You saved me. He breathed in awe. I don't want to be repaid, Niji. Naruto snorted and gripped the other boy's shoulder, bringing him to his feet. And I'm not Uzumaki-sama. I'm just Naruto to my friends. 
The true meaning of that sentence was not lost on Niji. He nodded slightly, throat closing up. Of course, Naruto. Go Naruto and I. Kanoamaru's yell from somewhere in the crowd cut through the shock. Suddenly, the spectators were on their feet, roaring and cheering with support for Naruto. The boy blinked and raised a hand, a small smile on his face. If anything, the deafening roar deepened, earning a winch from Naruto. You realize the repercussions? Surprisingly, it was Sasuke who spoke. The Uchiha had watched Naruto without a jealous eye for once. Sealing was an art that was honed and perfected over years. For Naruto to have been called a seal master by the proctor, he had been doing this for a long time. This was not an art the Sharingan was able to copy. I know. Naruto sighed. Luckily for me, the Hyuga clan has to admit theft of my clan seal. I know documents proving it exists. If they think that time heals all wounds, then they are very much wrong. But that doesn't mean they'll still try to get out of the rest of our agreement. We won't let them. Shikamaru shrugged. You'll have the Uzumaki and Senju names, plus with Saratobi, Nara, Yamanaka, and Akimichi on your side, you'll be fine. True. Naruto agreed. If they went against us, they would be spelling out their own doom. When did you get so savvy with politics? Karina asked. Since I've lived with him. Naruto jerked a thumb at Shikamaru. Imagine being forced to play shogi every night by him and Shikaku-san. Saying no is not an option. Ah. Naruto chanced a glance at the Kage box. While Orochimaru was hidden, his frustration could not be. He was going to act soon. Naruto knew it. Suddenly, a sharp pain went through the blonde's heart, causing him to spasm slightly. Only Shikamaru and Lee noticed it. Such hatred. Naruto ground out, massaging his chest. Eyes widened in realization. There's someone else here. Gara, who was close enough to hear him, looked at Naruto quizzically. What do you mean? Someone else is going to take part in the invasion. Naruto grimaced. I don't know who, but the hatred that I'm sensing is directed towards Kanoha and me. Specifically at me. Who? Shikamaru swore. Who haven't we accounted for? IWA. Lee breathed with sudden realization. Who hates Kanoha the most besides Orochimaru? Damn it. Naruto slammed his fist into the railing. But how? We've doubled security. Won't the guards have noticed Dash? Ah. They would have noticed IWA Shinobi, but merchants, traveling people? No. The Chunin exams brought many foreign merchants into the area. It would have been child's play to infiltrate. Just then, Gara grasped his arm. Damn. He hissed. His siblings and John and Sensei were looking at him expectantly. Five minute warning. That's it. Naruto grimaced. This wasn't going like planned. IWA and Orochimaru are working together. But he doesn't know that Suna has betrayed him. Plus the four of us are insanely powerful. Gara deadpanned. Still. Lee trailed off, deep in thought. I'll send a Kage Bunshin out for patrol. Naruto muttered, creating the clone outside of the arena. Meanwhile, let me try to pinpoint the enemy nin's location. You still are not fully you, Naruto. The QB grimaced. While your sensing skills have improved, you still cannot detect individual hatred. I know. Naruto growled in frustration. And that's the worst part. Match number two, Uchiha Sasuke of Kanoha versus Sabaku no Gara of Suna. Gara hissed slowly. This couldn't happen, not right now. A quick glance to Sasuke told him that the kid was waiting for him. At a snail's pace, he resigned himself to walking down to the floor. Sasuke looked annoyed. Ten. Face each other. The proctor said. Nine. Are you ready? 
8. Both of them nodded. 7. Get ready. They both tensed, but for different reasons. 6. Start. Sasuke charged, only to be met with Gara's sand as defense. 5. Gara was on the defensive, not bothering to strike Sasuke at all. 4. He blocked a kick lazily with his sand. 3. Sasuke attempted to attack his back. 2. Gara allowed Sasuke to place a kick to his solar plexus. 1. White feathers started to fall from the sky and Gara smiled a bloodthirsty smile. It was time. Looking to his comrades, Gara saw all three of them nod. If anything, his smile widened. And then, all hell broke loose. Kanoha, Namike's Minato's former apartment, present time. You're from the future. Kakashi repeated blandly. You. Gara too. Not physically though, just mentally. Lee wrinkled his nose from the dust. But he didn't regain his memories until he came into contact with Kurama. Kurama. Kakashi parroted. The QB. Are, are you okay? Naruto asked hesitantly, poking Kakashi's still form with his finger. Do you need water or something? Shut up. The older man roared, chakra flaring before settling down. Do you understand how ridiculous you sound? Time travel is not possible. You are looking at the kid who sealed Shikaku back into Gara and removed the Hugakur seal, and you say that time travel is impossible? Shikamaru scowled. You died. Naruto said softly causing Kakashi to look at him. The pain in the boy's voice left the older man stunned. All of you died. We were the only ones left. Dad's iration, it's a space-time ninjutsu. The seal I used to bring us back ten years into the past was a derivation of the iration. Kakashi slumped against the wall. This couldn't be possible. It wasn't, was it? Dad knows. Shikamaru muttered. If you have doubts, ask Dad. He's the one who deduced it a while back. Shikaku-sama knows? Kakashi whipped his head up. And he believes you? Like Shika said, he was the one who first figured it out and approached us. Lee said, his tone hard. Believe us, Kakashi-sensei, at first we too had trouble believing it. However, we realized we were given a chance to save you. All of you. You died. Naruto had said. We were the only ones left. That utterly lost tone that Naruto had spoken and couldn't be faked. But. The Hitaki air closed his mouth. So that's why you became so powerful so quickly. Naruto released the breath he was holding and smiled. Yes, that's why. Kakashi let out a breath and sunk down against the wall. I'm still processing all of this. Don't expect me to accept all of this right away. A genuine smile lit up Naruto's face. I wouldn't expect any less from you. After a few moments of heavy breathing, Kakashi stood up again with a creak of his joints. The invasion. IWA was unexpected. Shikamaru frowned. Last time, Suna attacked us with Orochimaru. Naruto explained. Sasuke and Gara were fighting when the same Jinjutsu used today was fell upon us. It was chaos. Eventually, Gara and I fought until I defeated him. But Naruto clenched his fists. The sanding paid the ultimate price. Kakashi's eye widened in realization. So that's why today you... Naruto nodded. I couldn't let the same thing happen again. He took a breath. Why didn't you tell me? Kakashi looked at Naruto. Why didn't you tell Hokage-sama? We could have helped you. We could have prevented this. We tried to prevent this. Naruto yelled. Guilt welled in him. That's why we tried so damn hard to protect everyone. Gara, Niji, Gigi, everyone played such an important role. I couldn't let them die. So you created ripples. 
Kakashi frowned. Yes. Lee said flatly. That's exactly what we did. For a second, Kakashi looked like he wanted to say something else, but refrained. How long did the war last? Our war? Six years. Mentally, myself, Gara, and Chika are twenty-two. Lee is twenty-three. Naruto winced in pain. His injuries were not bad, but they still hurt. Hence the maturity and knowledge you shouldn't have. Kakashi stated dryly. They said nothing. Fine. I believe you. Kakashi threw his hands up. The truth was, he didn't truly want to believe it, but there had been no traces of a lie in any of the boy's eyes. But once things are back to normal, all of you are going to tell me exactly what happened that made you come back to the past. Naruto nodded. Understood, Inutaishu. At the use of his old ANBU designation, the scarecrow smiled ever so slightly. Whatever, Hokage-sama. Kakashi left in a puff of smoke, leaving three weary time travelers trying to make sense of the past day. Suffice to say, I don't think IWA is going to want to be anywhere near Kanoha right now, or ever. Shikamaru snorted. He didn't see the sorrow on Naruto's face. The three of them slid down the walls of the Yandame's house in unison. Naruto tucked his head in between his knees. I won't forgive myself for this. He ground out. Or that snake. It's not your fault. Shikamaru said gruffly, awkwardly patting Naruto on the back. It's better than last time at least. After everything, everything that we fought to prevent, history still has a way of repeating itself. Naruto's fist slammed against the floor, causing a dull echo in the room. His voice choked, and a hysterical sob racked his body. This time, Lee's hand stroked his best friend's back in a comforting manner. He too was having a hard time keeping his emotions in check. But as the oldest, he had to keep a strong face. We knew that some things would stay the same, Naruto. Kurama's voice was unexpectedly soft. Sometimes, not even an act of kami can change what was meant to be. Stop it. Naruto whispered. Stop trying to make me feel better, Kurama. Shikamaru sighed. Wincing from his injuries, he still managed to get Naruto to face him and Lee. Placing his hands on the younger boy's shoulders, he looked straight into watery eyes. Listen to me. Naruto's head snapped up at the authoritative tone. Stop blaming yourself. The Nara shook Naruto to emphasize his point. You saved so many today, you became a hero, Naruto. This, what happened, that is not your fault. He's dead, Shika. Naruto threw Shikamaru's hands off of him. He's dead because I couldn't protect him. Enough. Lee's tired tone cut through Naruto. Exhausted black eyes pierced the blonde. Shikamaru is right, Rudo. Stop it. You make it sound like you're the only one who had the skills to save him. Are you forgetting about us? Are you forgetting about the dozens of Jonas in this village? You are not alone. There was silence in the room save for Naruto's labored breathing. We all saw what happened, Naruto. Shikamaru spoke quietly. Gently, he pulled Naruto closer to him. Your hands were tied. No one blames you, no one. He was a good man. Naruto managed to say. The history between IWA and Kanoha aside, that man always put his village before him. Idashi paused, a fresh wave of guilt crashing over him. I respected him. And you know what the worst thing is? Naruto said bitterly. We can't even mourn him. He was the enemy. IWA. It doesn't matter if he was manipulated. He was scum in Kanoha's eyes. What would people think if they knew that Uzumaki Naruto was crying over dead rock trash? There was a lump in Lee's throat that didn't want to go away. Unfortunately, he knew what people would think. And he hated it. So let's mourn. Shikamaru said firmly, his eyes glinting. We may not be able to in public, 
but when it's just us, who cares? I agree. Lee flinched when he tried to sit on his knees, so he opted to slump against the wall. His hands were already folded in a gesture of prayer. Naruto swallowed audibly, but managed to get to his knees. He placed his hands together and looked towards the ceiling, unshed tears wavering within his eyes. Wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying the afterlife. Naruto smiled ever so slightly. If you see my dad, I hope the two of you can make up. Nothing facilitates male bonding than a good clashing of the fists. Lee added. Hopefully your back feels better. Shikamaru chuckled. The trio clapped their hands together twice and bowed their heads. Naruto held out his hand as if he were holding a saucer of sake. Here's to you, Anoki Jichan. May you rest in peace, Sandang Tsuchikich-sama. And from high above the trio, in another plane of existence, the Sandang Tsuchikich gazed down upon the son of his hated enemy with exasperation and annoyance. Only Namike's son would be stupid enough to try and save an enemy. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? That is the end of the video. Comment Dango if you have completed the fanfiction and I I will see you guys later.